you're about to put a knife to a human body. Uh, that's a rare thing, and you're never going to forget it. So I just called up a lab. I was like, hello, this is Dr. Headley, and I would like a cadaver, please, in a laboratory in which to cut it up. There's another side of our field who, mm. are, who literally say adhesions aren't a thing. You, having seen thousands of bodies, or mm -hmm. tens of thousands of bodies at this point, what do you know about that? You can bring back fluidity to tissues through through movement. Uh, you guys and, hear that yeah. out there? F no. And yeah. those people who say you can't do it, won't do it, and they can sit on their asses and turn into wood. We talk a lot about poop on this show. <laughs> we are in, in poop trouble. We're in deep shit in this country. <laughs> what is so amazing about foreskin? Oh, my God. <laughs> How many hours does this podcast go for? It smells, they'll say. Yeah, or it yeah, gets well, dirty. Well, so does your <laughs> asshole if you, don't, if you don't wipe it. The skin will move back and forth over the glands, and that feels good. What happens if we take that away? And what is the effect in terms of sex function is to take away pleasure. And that was why it was done in this country. It can cause death. Oh, yeah, fuck. people can die. All right, Gil, great to have you here today. Uh, can you explain a little bit of what you do and how you got into all this? <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark. I, I'm a... I'm an explorer of the inner space, let's put it that way, uh, the inner space of the human form. I do that as I call myself a somonaut. So I call anyone who does that a somonaut, someone who's like a sailor navigating the body, right? So I navigate the inner space. And I, really, I started out doing bo uh, bodybuilding as a high schooler, learned about my muscles from Arnold Schwarzenegger, got real interested in what I could see in a mirror. And then I got curious about what was a little deeper in. So uh, anatomy was interesting to me from high school. My biology teacher gave us a rat. We dissected it. I did a good job. She gave us a cat. I was like, this gets better Ooh. all the time. <laughs> so I dissected that cat, did a real nice job. And by senior year, I was walking behind my friends as they dissected their cats, teaching them how to do it. <clears throat> and so... Uh, well, I, I didn't get to do much of that in college, although I bagged a lot of fetal pigs working in an anatomy lab. And then I... Um, wait, 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 bagged a lot of fetal pigs? <laughs> yeah, bagged a lot of fetal... I, I worked... Uh, I was like, I'm work, sure a lot of people have in college. Yeah, work study in college. I, I worked in a biology lab. And yeah. so one of my tasks was to autoclave fruit flies and scrape the maggots out of the jars. And another one mm. of my jobs was to bag the fetal pigs and get them ready for dissection. Wow. Okay. Uh, but when I got to... Uh, and I did a lot of lot of lot of weightlifting. Kept up with that. Got into Tai Chi uh, in grad school, and that got me even more interested in the body mm -hmm. as well. And uh, I took the opportunity uh, to go into the lab with a friend of mine who was a med student. He was like needed a little help on uh, in his study sessions, and I had been uh, simultaneous to getting my PhD in ethics. I was also training as a massage therapist. And so I had a little background. He was happy to have me there with him on Saturdays in, in Chicago in a lab there. And uh, so I did my first dissections just with a friend that mm -hmm. way. They would have done an arm earlier in the week, and then he's going to study the arm for the test on Monday. So yeah. there was one arm left over. He's like, it's yours. And so I dissected that with no instruction, having no clue what I was doing. Did you feel uh, like okay just dealing with body parts? Because perfectly honest, if I just saw an arm, I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I, I was um, I I was intimidated by it for okay, sure, actually. Okay. And I had there's a whole body on the table, and I was like, mm. do this arm, and so uh, then do this leg, and then do this abdomen, and that's kind of how we did it. I went mm -hmm. in there four or five times. I and, mean, you're cutting it open and stuff, right? Yeah, cutting it open, and I, I'll never forget that first cut. It makes an impression on you. I tell that to everybody who takes a course with me. Just give yourself a deep breath if you're about to put a knife to a human body. Uh, that's a rare thing, and you're never going to forget it. So take it mm. in any way you can, but yeah. pay attention to what you're doing. And because I, I always remember that. But I basically gave myself some kind of PTSD from doing it. To be honest, I was not comfortable, uh, okay. you know. But the, the the information was compelling to me, and so I kept on going. And when I got out of grad school, I trained as a as a rolfer. Now that's a kind of body work. It's like a it's like a stru called structural integration, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I practiced that and. As I took up that profession, I was like, 
golly, I'm digging around and people have no idea what I'm doing. I need to know more anatomy. And that got me to the lab. So I just called up a lab. I was like, hello, this is Dr. Headley. And I would like a cadaver, please, in a laboratory in which to cut it up. <laughs> and, then, and the dude was like, you come down here. We'll have a chat. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, we made good friends that day. Uh, my friend Roger Faison from a lab in, in Newark. And he, he made space for me in that lab. And I did exactly that. And yeah. I brought some Rolfers in. And together we... You know, I led that first dissection class uh, with uh, four days of knowledge ahead of the people in the room, and uh, and it was a disaster. We made <laughs> an incredible, <laughs> incredible mess, but learned so much. It was yeah. so compelling, and I was like, I got to kind of keep, I got to do that again. You know, that once is not enough, but I was having nightmares over the way that I did it, mm. right? Because the way that I did it, I was just following the textbook or whatever, and uh, regional anatomy, you know, cuts things up into parts, right? Tries to identify this thing and that thing, separate it all out. Yeah. Or take the machine apart, as it were. <clears throat> well, we're not a machine. We're a continuity. A whole thing differentiates out of one embryo. And so one thing I had learned in my Rolfing training was that there are kind of textural layers, biological fabrics that each have different qualities that you can feel with your hands and mm -hmm. you can work on from head to toe. Well, I wanted to see that. I didn't want to see the region. I wanted to see the continuity. So I had a, kind of dreamed up a different way of doing the dissection. Instead of dissecting by region, I decided I could dissect by layer. Right, And I thought that would be interesting. So I got a few colleagues together, and we went in there. I said, here's how we're going to try and do this. And, and we did it that way. And I was like, is this compelling? Is this interesting to you? Do you find it educational? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to keep doing that. And I started teaching classes where groups would come together, and we'd take a given uh, individual donor form, a donor gift as a present. You open it up. When you're given a gift, you open it up, right? So we would open up these presents. And, uh, and do it by layer. And it's very, very interesting because while you're dissecting one layer away from another, you start to, uh, oh, that's me, you start to uh, be able to see the relationships between those layers. So it becomes less about making parts of things than about feeling into the connections within the body. And that's always been my goal is to kind of assemble my own consciousness and relationship to the body mm -hmm. internally from doing this work. So I'm not a medical doctor, that's not my thing. I have a PhD in theological ethics. I took this up as a, as a way of becoming more embodied myself and helping facilitate other people do that. How mm. do you get in there if you have no, no sense of it, no visuals, if you have n no, nothing to imagine yeah. that's accurate, right? So how can you feel into relationships? Well, you can touch them with your hands. You can take it apart. You can feel the resistance as you try and take tissues apart. And that resistance, instead of trying to make a thing out of, the, out of it, the resistance tells you something about the relationship, the connection, the strength, mm. the integrity. And so I'm trying to put together the body by dissecting it rather than turn it into parts and things. Can you tell the difference between like a body that may have been uh, the person may have been stiff or tight or maybe didn't move well versus someone that might have moved more fluidly. And do you have any uh, do you have any way of knowing that information? Like do you have someone you can consult that uh, knew the person or something like that? Sometimes I knew the person. Oh. Right? Mm. So, I mean, I can it, – it's, it's getting to be that way now this far in my career. At the beginning, I was always dealing with an anonymous – donations. I had no information on them at all. Uh, so I'm just kind of just stuck with what's in front of me, which isn't a bad thing to go by because often people don't know what's going on inside their body. There wasn't enough medical records to determine what was going on inside that body. So I'll actually end up knowing more about them than they ever did, even about themselves. But uh, I can look at the joints, I can look at the bones, I can look at the, the texture of the tissues, but they change and alter when you die, right? So yeah. if, mm. if you're embalmed, for instance, if they embalm the body, meaning preserve it, Right, it's a kind of like a pickling process, like a like a room temperature pickling process. This and, is reminding me of Dexter. Uh, <laughs> you no, know, he didn't bother pickling. Them, he that didn't guy. pickle. That's yeah, true. He, he he was unethical. That guy, you know, he <laughs> he, he didn't ask permission. You know, mm. he 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 took liberties, and I I don't do that. I, I, just, <laughs> I know. I just <laughs> work with gifts. So the the um. Uh, the texture changes that happen both from just dying, right? Mm -hmm. And now all the, all the tone goes out of the body, right? So, so the same thing under anesthesia. They put you under anesthesia, you go to a puddle, 
right? You don't have any more tone in the body. <laughs> Same thing happens when you die. The tone leaves the body, and the tone is the signature of those stressors in your body, right? So some of that is gone, and I don't get to see that. Uh, Where do you think some of that tone yeah. comes from? Does that come from like nerve That's, impulses? Or yeah, like? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it comes from your emotional organization, right? Yeah. Like in other words, the way you put your nervous system through your body is going to generate more tone in some areas, less tone in other areas. Also, there's going to be more um, even fibrous buildup in some areas and less in other areas. So you can ch you, the, the mechanical tissues you know, can be altered by life, right? So that if you use something a lot, it'll grow and build and get stronger. If you don't use it so much, it'll shrink and get atrophied. So I can see the signatures of that in a body. But I'll tell you, a body can change a whole lot in three months before you die. So you might have been a robust build all your life, but then you get uh, some wasting disease like cancer, and in one or two months, all that work is gone gone up the flu in, in a month or two. I had that uh, to be the case with a younger man, 53 years old, who I, I worked on for what I call my A to Z project. And he had been a very robust build. He was a friend of our lab director yeah. who was his massage therapist. Uh, but then he was a very skinny, you know, skinny form on the table. So, you know, there's a lot of illusions <laughs> that happen, you know, in that transition from the from the vitality of life to your passing. And so sometimes I get mi I get clues that aren't quite accurate, right? So mm. I, but I can look in those tissues and still you can see stuff. Like if you're in a car accident or something, you get pins and plates put in and all that stuff and your body tries to accommodate for those changes and in injuries. You'll see some very strange things in the body in terms of the organization of the tissues. But can I tell if somebody was a yogi or something? I'm not so sure. Uh, do we know if you can see fascia or not? Like, do you know if you can see it? I've spent my whole career seeing fascia. Mm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, and also... So what, I, what is it? Can you describe it to us or tell us yeah, more about it? Yeah, sure. So uh, fascia is basically, uh, what I say, an aggregate of connective tissues that can be dissected into a sheet. That would be a real basic definition of fascia. It wraps around other tissues. Um, so you can define it in a negative that way. But fascia also is a, is a living matrix of your body, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's that in which everything else is growing and taking form. It's the shaping element of your body, but it's also a whole body communication system, right? Because forces transmit through it. Yeah. So your forces of just your gait or your stepping or your movements, your behaviors, your emotional life, all those forces are going through the fascial network and impacting the whole body simultaneously. There's no escape from it because it's a, well, my friends Rosemary Fidus and Lewis Schultz called an endless web, mm. right? So that endless web uh, is is the the fascial matrix uh, of your body, basically. So uh, connective tissue is the larger category in which fascia is like a lower down in the totem pole of anatomical nomenclature. So we have connective tissue, and within the connective tissue framework, you have blood, you have bone, you have fascia. So fascia is is uh, an element. Now, I go through a lot of work over my career to help people not just have one idea of what fascia is, right? So there are different types of fascia in your body, right? There's, there's a dense, regular, fibrous fascia like your IT band, but your IT band is embedded in another kind of fascia that I call perifascia, and that's a more slippery, membranous substance that you can also, is a connective tissue aggregate that can be cut into a sheet. I can show uh, you all day long. Maybe a little bit akin <laughs> to like the way that you, you know, bite into a steak and sometimes there's fatty tissue that you can easily eat and goes perfectly with the muscle and yeah. other times there's a fatty chunk that Gristle. you kind of just need to spit yeah. out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You are nailing it on the head, <laughs> right? So the, the I didn't think it would be that simple. But. It is that simple. So the, 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 the stuff you got to spit out, that's the dense, regular fibrous fascia, or you might call it deep fascia, fascia profunda. You know, so we call we call it that. And then the, I kind of have that white. It's like a, like on a steak. This is my only comparison. So I've never yeah, hacked yeah. open a body. Oh, it works. But it has like a little. Uh, I'm afraid you are steak, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, yeah, I am. It has a little like sheath of uh, like white over top of the muscle. Exactly. And then if you go to cut into it, you're like, what the hell is that? Yeah. You can't find a knife sharp enough to cut through it. Sometimes. Yeah. So that the kind of the delicious fatty layer that would be like superficial fascia or the mm -hmm. subcutaneous adipose, and then that fibrous layer that would be the dense regular fascia and the fact that you can get those two apart mm 
is because there's a membrane in between them. That would mm. be the perifascia. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's all there in your steak. <laughs> it's a, what fascia is this? Sorry, Nzima. Like, well, that would be a dense, regular fibrous fascia in that image, right? So you can see there's multiple directions uh, of the layering of that tissue, right? So mm -hmm. there's, there's a up and down fibers, and then there's a cross fibers. And what we're looking at actually there is the IT band, right? And that's, uh, and I'm going to, if I pull on it in mm -hmm. one direction, right, those fibers might approximate and get closer to each other, the up and down fibers. Right now, that's pulling in other direction. It's like rubber bands. You see that? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's amazing. So when wow. this is when you say I've never seen that. That's make a awesome. make a muscle, right? If you say mm -hmm. make a muscle, right, and the ch and the body changes shape, right? You get a bulge in your biceps. You get a bulge in your thigh. <laughs> that bulging is possible because those fibers going across the screen there. Right, are, are arranged, the collagen is arranged in such a way that it can expand like a rubber band. It has elasticity and it recoils just like you saw it do. So you have that all over your body. And then the, the, the fibers going up and down on the screen from top to bottom, those ones are not elastic. So people will ask me, does fascia stretch? I'm like, well, which way are you pulling it? And which, yeah. which fibers of the fascia do you have in mind? Because if by stretch you mean elastic a recoil, mm -hmm. then there's a whole lot of it in that tissue, mm. right? It's it, it's very stretchable. But if you if if by stretch, I mean you can take a, a basket woven of reeds, right, and pull on it, and and it'll distend because of the organization of the weave permits, right, a change of the organization of fibers. So you can stretch something. You can stretch something made out of fibers that aren't elastic. Yeah. Right, depending upon you know if you if you if by elastic or stretch you mean change its shape and have it return to its shape, mm -hmm. so and that, <clears throat> that also speaks to range of motion. But as we were talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you're fine. If we were talking about a little earlier, um, uh, and my friend Jules Mitchell was talking about this on my own show. Uh, she's a biomechanist, uh, and it's like if we have talking about force and you know f force and load yes uh, that's also a way of thinking about stretching yeah so it doesn't necessarily mean um getting to be long like gumby on a mat mm -hmm. you know it could mean putting weights into your curl bar and lifting it up in which case you're changing the force and load of the tissues dynamically and and that could be a way of thinking about stretching as well force and load i yeah. thought that was a pretty interesting way to think about it beyond range of motion because we don't always want to increase the range of motion of a joint will fall apart right if we increase it too much we're going to fall apart mm -hmm. you know? but if you can like you just mentioned if you can strengthen that uh, tissue at a specific range so just don't don't just stretch the tissue mm -hmm. and just passively get in that position but mm -hmm. can you add stress to that tissue in that range Beautiful. and control yeah. it back and forth. Exactly. That's a strong tissue. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. that's what you want to have that ability, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, because just to be Gumby isn't going to get you too far. Question about um, scar tissue and adhesions. Because, mm -hmm. like, as we were talking about, like, fascia, we've had different people that have come on the podcast. Like, we have a guy that we know has been here twice. His name's Chris Godowski. He's worked with so many bodies. Mm. And by putting pressure in certain areas, he was able to feel adhesions and mm. scar tissue. And then over time, he's able to literally feel these things move away. And mm -hmm. then the, the individual's able to move that area in a yeah. much better fashion. Mm -hmm. But there's another side of our field who mm. are, who literally say adhesions aren't a thing. Mm. You can't really work out adhesions with pressure. Mm. So you having seen thousands of bodies or mm -hmm. tens of thousands of bodies at this point, what is what do you know about that? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. uh, whenever people are having an argument, they tend to be using the same words in different ways, right? And so mm -hmm. if people want to spare themselves a whole lot of trouble, they should define their terms up front, okay. right? And, and then they might find they actually agree about something, yeah. right? So uh, if we're talking about something like adhesions, right? I mean, what do you do? If you have an adhe ad adhesive substance, what does it do? It sticks one thing to another. Mm -hmm. So if, if we... Uh, we have all kinds of things stuck one to another, and our whole body is stuck to itself, right? Yeah. In, in a good way, all right? So we have, and it's differentiated into these different tissues that are actually adherent to each other. You want the parietal <laughs> pleura to be adherent to the endothoracic fascia inside your chest. If you don't, your lungs collapse, right? So you, you can't, you, so there's purposeful mm -hmm. adhesion, there's purposeful connection. And then 
we can talk about, say, pathological adhesion, or things stuck together that don't belong stuck together. Or maybe by adhesion we mean things that don't move as nicely as they used to or maybe relative a, to a each knot. other. Uh, maybe a knot, right. and and that's a little different, right? <laughs> right. So so a, a knot, right? When we feel our muscle tissue kind of balled up, that's excessive tone, mm. right? Excessive tone. That's like hyperactive nerve input to given motor units in your muscle tissue that leave it on when it ought to be off, right? So you want off rather than on if you're not doing any work, right? You want, you sh your tissue should be soft when you're not using them and then they should firm up when you are using them. If you're not doing anything and they're, and they're like balls of, uh, balls of hard meat, well, that's not so good, right? Yeah. So that's a nerve, that's a nerve uh, impulse and, and digging around on that can, trigger certain phenomenon that can tell those tissues to relax. That's not, I wouldn't call that an adhesion though. I would call an adhesion where <clears throat> tissues that would move relative one to another, what I call differential movement, are now not doing that, for instance. Mm -hmm. So they used to move relative to each other and now they're just stuck to each other, right? So what happened there? Well, tissues that have differential movement in the musculoskeletal system have that differential movement because intervening between the two moving tissues is another tissue. And that is continuous, tissue, tissue, tissue. But the one in between is slippery, wet, and membranous, whereas these ones might be muscle fibers. So you have muscle fiber group, muscle fiber group, and between them, a membrane. So there can be activity in one group of muscle fibers when there's no activity in this group of muscle fibers. And we do that all day long. You don't recruit every muscle fiber in a given muscle group every time you do some. If you did, you'd have a Charlie horse. That sucks, right? That's got, you, know, you know what a Charlie horse yeah. is like, and all of a sudden your calf goes bong mm. and it turns into a hard ball. That's when all of the motor units of your calf are firing at the same time. That's not functional, right? But what is functional is some on some off and what permits some on and some off to happen is that there's membrane in between them but if the quality if the status of that membrane changes right and gets l loses some of its slipperiness in any gradation from a hundred percent to you know to zero mm -hmm. right so we have hundred percent slipperiness and say you lose say you lose ten percent <laughs> of your slipperiness throughout that tissue and it's a little gluier, a little gummier. Not, it's not as slippery. It's getting more viscous. It's getting thicker. Why? It could be dehydrated. Could have certain chemistry that's suboptimal. Could be underused. Could be inflamed. Mm. These different factors are going to contribute to a reduction of the capacity of there to be differential movement way down low inside of the system. And, uh, and it can go further. If you have a cr place in your body that's chronically not used, that's chronically inflamed, right, then ultimately you're going to start generating like uh, crystal formations inside of that membrane. And it's going to move from gummy towards brittle even, right? It now, might even calcify. It, it could calcify. Yeah, it could do that. And then that, that, that tendons at risk of snapping, right? And you see that in elderly folks who haven't used certain things in a long while. They step off the curb and they pop a tendon or something like that. Well, can you get it back? You know, that, so there's to your question about adhesions, right? Because I would call that a, a, a growing adhesion, mm -hmm. right? When the differential movement is being reduced over time, right, from lack of use or from chronic inflammation, stasis, dehydration, and inflammation cause adhesion, right? And movement is the opposite, use, right? So once you activate those tissues, they're like, oh, this is what we do. We do this, and then your body's going to bring fluid to that area, and things are going to get improved. So you can go in either direction, So, and you can either move yourself or someone can move you. Mm -hmm. So if someone's touching, like the example that you gave, they can work the tissues in such a way that it, it reproduces the notion of movement for that person, right? And so now you're moving for them. Well, that can be good because not everybody has to get up and go. Well, they mm -hmm. need to be facilitated. And then yeah. once they feel it and once they've been moved, then they'll move, right? And then they can keep that change mm -hmm. right because even, even the pressure on the muscle is kind of movement in a way it, it, and, absolutely and stretching in it, some it, degree it, it is or the elbow of a rougher or a body worker right some or a pt what have you right you put pressure you call for movement right someone wiggles their foot while your arm is on their calf and you are literally changing the texture of the tissue both at a neurological level 
but also at a physiological level in terms of the viscosity uh, of the of the interfaces of the tissue, right? Yeah. So you're bringing fluid, you're bringing life, really. You're bringing circulation, you're washing out old stuff, you're, you're caught, you put pressure and you kind of dry out the sponge in a capillary bed and you take the pressure off and the b body restores the fluid mm -hmm. as you take the pressure off. And so then you can, you can bring back fluidity to tissues through, through movement, whether it's yours or, or whether it's through help. Uh, you guys and, hear that yeah. out there? Fuck y'all. <laughs> <laughs> People are saying you can't do it, but we're, we're big believers. We, big we, people, yeah, yeah, well, that's kind of ridiculous, actually, to say you can't do mm -hmm. it. And and yeah. those people who say you can't do it won't do it, and they can sit on their asses and turn into wood. You know? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so that would be the summary of that long scientific speech. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> so, I like it. That's awesome. That's great. All right, Roger family, it's time to step up your barefoot shoe game. Now, we talk about foot health all the time on the podcast, but the winter months are coming and Vivo's come out with some slick boots. These are their Gobi boots and they have different colors on their website. Now these have a wide toe box. They are flat and they are flexible and they are stylish and sexy <laughs> as boots. But obviously Vivo is awesome because they not only have boots and casual shoes like their Novus right here, which again, wide, flat, flexible so that your foot can do what it needs to do within the shoe and you're getting the benefit of having your feet improve while you're walking around in shoes, but they also have shoes for the gym, like their Modus, again, flat, flexible, wide toe box, along with their Primus Light 3s and all the classics that you know. They also have shoes for running and trail running on their website. So again, for all barefoot type shoes, Vivo is your one-stop shop for pretty much all the types of kicks you need. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash power project, where for the entire month of December, but December only, you guys will receive 20% off your very own Vivo Barefoot shoes. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash power project, links in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Uh, so, but then there's a whole other kind of adhesion that's going to be arising what, from what I would say we'll call healing, right? So we don't want to give all adhesion a bad rap, right? So if you get a cut, right, if you get a wound, if you get a surgery, we have a miracle that happens in our body. It agglomerates. It self-sticks. Mm -hmm. It forms a bloody scab. I mentioned that blood was connected tissue earlier on. It's got fibers in it, and under certain conditions, those fibers will activate and, and be used to, to rebuild the tissue, right? It'll fill in a hole. This is a good thing. This keeps us on the planet longer, so we don't want to get all down on the fact that our tissues can agglomerate. Like over time, actually, that's like the the doctor that lives within our body that can put us back together under the circumstance of injury. So like I'll fix this. I'll just make it so it can't move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you can. That's right. right. I, I'll fix it. And then the question is. Like, so are we going to get mad because we have a scar or are we going to thank goodness that we have a scar? Well, you can thank goodness that you have a scar and then you can work with that scar, right? So you don't have to just settle for a, a nature's version of what, what was needed at the moment, right? You can, you can approach that tissue and you're not going to, you don't want to make the scar go away. It's holding your body together, right? But you can change its pliability, the level of circulation that flows through it, the ease w with which nerves pass through it. Are they stressed or not stressed? Are they pinched or not pinched? Are they getting blood supply? Are they not getting blood supply? So you can work with scar tissue in, in a way that restores pliability and circulation. You can have that, that agglomerated tissue that represents your healing without it being an interrupter, you know, mm -hmm. without it, without it uh, taking away your movement potential to a certain extent. You know, sometimes there are certain events that happen to a body that, that you'd just be glad you still have a body and that you're still in it. You know. So we can get some blood back to the area mm -hmm. uh, with movement, with uh, stretching, with uh, perhaps having somebody, a body worker mm -hmm. uh, working on us. Um, and I'm not sure how aware you are of like uh, voodoo flossing, you know, like wrapping an area. I'm aware of voodoo, but not voodoo <laughs> flossing. <laughs> Com compressing an area, uh, wrapping it tightly with an elastic band, and oh. then you're cutting off the circulation to okay. the area. And then the idea is when you take it off, uh, circulation kind of goes back what? into it. Okay, that's so interesting. Multiple... You got to be careful with that. You got to okay. know, know all about uh, tourniquets and you don't want to like... Yeah, wanna, overdo it. We don't want to yeah. overdo that. Yeah. Right. 
Because then the arm falls off. <laughs> yeah, not so much pressure where the arm's changing color. Yeah, I think we yeah. do like uh, maybe 30 to 50% of a rat. You know, oh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not yanking it well, 100%. There's a video of uh, our buddy uh, mm -hmm. Kelly Sturette messing oh, with Oh, Kelly, that. uh huh? That's a friend of Joe Miller's, right? And so, yeah. And so what we'll do a lot of times is we will tack down the fibers by uh -huh. wrapping it up the way he's doing so there. Uh huh. And then once it's wrapped, you will spend two to three minutes or so okay. uh, m just moving that area around. And now that rubber band, because of the elasticity to it and the stickiness of it, uh -huh. it's going to move the fibers around in the elbow and in the forearm where Kelly's wrapping. And uh, he'll get uh, some restoration from that, mm -hmm. and then he'll release it. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that more blood flow comes to the area. We, we've had a tremendous amount of success with this. We don't mm -hmm. know, like, all the science behind it. but Well, that's very interesting because what it's kind of doing is replicating certain types of body work, right? Yeah, absolutely. Where, where they just, I mean, uh, as a rolfer, I would just lean on somebody with my elbow for several mm -hmm. minutes. Right, not and unlike that, and, and your elp, your skin, and the other person's mm -hmm. skin could have like friction a little yeah, bit the way that band does, and it can I, kind I, of pull I, and absolutely. stretch. Absolutely, right? yeah, absolutely. You're shearing the tissues, right. and pressure and shearing at the same time. So that's it's cheaper than rolfing. <laughs> 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 I don't know what you pay for the tape, but not much. <laughs> a roughing not much. session is not cheap, but the, the, it also won't love on you quite the same way. But I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. you get an opportunity to look at a body, um, you know, my understanding is the body's made up of a lot of water. And mm. a lot of you were mentioning hydration, and it's mm -hmm. important that there's uh, some hydration kind of so that these uh, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and so forth will slide and glide and move very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the word viscous. I've heard before that some of that water that is in there is kind of viscous, is kind of uh, thick or gel-like. I don't know. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mean, we use our words and it generates ideas in our mind about w what it is actually like. But the living body is like a gel. Yeah, it's more, but a slippery, a slippery gel mm -hmm. um, for sure. And then again, the question is like, what's its status? What's its quality? So uh, we're, 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 want, we're wanting the the slipperiness and uh and you can there's this concept called thixotropy okay where the the, th the thixotropic effect is where you take something from a gel state and put it into solution through pressure so you and that's like a bodywork activity right you put pressure on something and, and then maybe you can you can uh put it into solution and then facilitate change. That's one idea of how something like rolfing works, although they might – you can't do that to all the tissues. Your tissue isn't just like a big jellyfish, right? You have some are the harder, some are more fibrous, and they're never going to turn to gel, and if they do, you're dead. Mm -hmm. right? You're a liquid at that point, and life is not good. But there are those membranes, those interfaces in your body, and that's where that gel – quality is represented in your tissues right so you you can you can actually intentionally go to those layers right and work with that gel look look at my you know you mm -hmm. we've got that ability you can't do that to a tree the tree bark doesn't slip and slide like that right mm -hmm. but we do now that's uh, and I've helped some people before with their pain and mm -hmm. pain management and just a little bit of body work stuff. And yeah. some people's tissues won't move like that. Yeah, won't exactly. Move at all. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah at all. That. You'll try to move their forearm around or something. And yeah, it's, it's like a brick. It's, it is. Uh, that's right. There's no differential movement. And it may not be differential movement on the outside, and you may not have differential movement on the inside. It could be like sclerified, mm -hmm. right? It can get solid. And so uh, now we talked about knots, right? So if you have knots that last for years, right, eventually that, that tissue quality is, is not having that gel quality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's gummed up, right? It can get permanent, right? Mm -hmm. Permanent in the sense that it's long-lasting. I'm not saying permanent in the sense that you still can't change it. I do believe you can change just about anything. This is an expression of mind, an expression of consciousness, and we can change our mind, right? And if you can change your mind, your body's going to follow suit. So th that's... Um, that's just the way it goes. So that that solid feeling is 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 the loss of differential movement from and 
but you can lean on that. <laughs> you can move it for them. And it's the same as them starting to do exercise. You can engage a person's consciousness there because we leave the building. You get an injury or something, right? And you're like, I don't like that anymore. That's a mean part of my body and I'm going to leave it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and we do. Instead of petting the child that bumped its knee, you know, you say, get out of the house, you're gone. <laughs> you know, and then uh, eventually you reject all parts, different parts of your body because we keep on getting injured, right? Yeah. And, and, and then you're just living in this tiny, little room in this incredible mansion and and the, and the abandoned rooms are turned into solid mm. you know so w when you give a person body work or you touch them as you described then you're inviting them back into that room of the mansion that they might have checked out of and and thought the you know they don't have some nice relationship with that what's your personal relationship to your whole body mm. are there areas of it that you into and that you like and other areas that you reject and won't go there mm -hmm. you know a lot of people they're like i want to be all musculoskeletal and don't even know they have guts <laughs> you know <laughs> like you have guts in there and they're interesting <laughs> that's part of your life you can't make it through the day without them but you might not give them any credit you might not go into that room you might not make space for your guts and then what's going to happen to them they can get gummy too mm. you know things can get mm. a little stale in the visceral pathways uh your heart can get get uh, get can get hard like the pharaoh's heart you know what i'm saying you you it's it, it doesn't have the same dynamic range of motion that it could right even your heart has a range of motion and we can reduce it through behavior and emotional states right like what type of behavior when you say that well, I say you hold your heart in anger mm -hmm. right for years and years and years you think that doesn't affect your physiology? Yeah. Uh, it sure does. It, cha it changes everything, actually. <clears throat> you can't reach out and hug somebody. You're too angry. You know, so it, that, and the heart center can, can uh, lose its range of motion. It's like being in a neurological rut and, and, or, or a movement rut. And the same for your guts as for the rest of you. you everything's got to move. Yeah. Mm. You know, I, I just want to... Because, Mark, you mentioned the hydration thing, and that is like an extremely practical thing that <clears throat> applied we shouldn't really gloss over because a lot of people, they're not drinking many liquids or they're electrolyte deficient. So when they try to go do these things or when they go to a body worker, when they're trying to move, they lack, you know, they lack hydration. They're lacking mm -hmm. the thing that will allow them to actually start to feel better when they're trying to move into these ranges that maybe they haven't before. Let's talk about that. because <laughs> So hydration, right? We can chug some water because we're thirsty and then we can piss it all out uh -huh. a few minutes later uh -huh. right because basically your tissues have to c call for water mm -hmm. right so if you don't if you drink water and don't move like you drink water at your desk you're writing your book and you're chugging water and, and you got a bucket underneath the desk <laughs> And you just put it in one end and piss it out the other, right? You're not getting hydrated from that water because you're not integrating it through movement into yes. your body. You're not, the tissues aren't demanding, they're not thirst, they're not calling for water like they're thirsty. You know, mm -hmm. they may be thirsty, but they're not, they're not shouting out for it because- And water to a certain degree can be uh, dehydrating even because you could be just kind of pissing out a lot of those that, minerals that, and so forth. That's right. That's exactly right. So you have to- uh, it's a little different to like sip water, right, and, and and wiggle around a bit, right, and maybe integrate it into your body than to chug it and, and stand still. But there's a whole other thing going on. We can be like chronically dehydrated in a sense. It takes about two gallons of water to digest your day's food. Now, we don't drink two gallons of water. We don't, day, damn. Right? And thank goodness, right? It's just not that fun unless you're, you know, carrying 80 pounds of pack and you're in Iraq, right, in the sunshine. And then you might drink six gallons of water in a day, and you could process that, right, because you're eliminating it as you go through sweat. But uh, normally we're not like that, right? So, so if we need two gallons of water to do that, where is it coming from? Well, we're recycling it, right? We're, we're reusing fluids in our body over and over again so you make a quart and a half a bile a day your liver makes that right now you, you and then and then that fluid goes into your intestines it gets to your cecum it gets reabsorbed and you do it again right and your gastric juices your saliva right your saliva all day long you're producing this juice well where does it come from it's recycled water from within your body mm -hmm. so you have like a reservoir of water in your body that you keep on using over and over again you you it goes in one place, it gets reabsorbed in the, in the, for instance, the bile, that quart and a half of bile. Your gallbladder is basically a bile dehydrator. It, so the bile is produced, it gets shunt up into the gallbladder, that 
pulls the water back into the general circulation and concentrates the bile to be a fat emulsifier. So we reuse our water is my point. Well, what if your whole body reservoir is chronically a little low, right? Well, then where is the water going to come from? If it's not coming from your, from your mouth, yeah. right, it's going to be coming from your joints. It's going to be coming from those membranes, right, that gel, right, that, that jelly-like uh, membranous interface that's permitting all that differential movement we talked about mm -hmm. is a reservoir, right, of water for your digestive processes if you're not adequately hydrated, right? So that's not good, right? If you can't reclaim it from your juicy bile and you got to start taking it out of your joints and your muscle tissues, you're going to be like a piece of beef jerky, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, no, I'm not literally. Easily you know, snappable. Saying, but you're, you're, you're moving in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so best to top it up a little bit. How do you avoid um, stiffness? Like you're on the road right now, I think 115 cities doing seminars and, uh, <laughs> You know, how, how are some ways that you oh, well, have found for yourself to avoid? You want to get into me now, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you, you think you think you're going to, like, get some kind of health advice from me? <laughs> it's not, it's just, um, I saw uh, you in the gym when we were talking to you. You were doing squats and stuff, and yeah. you were on the ground, and you were moving around. <laughs> That's because the first time I've been in a space bigger than four <laughs> square feet in the last three days. I so, also think, yeah, you're in an RV, right? <laughs> yeah. One thing that's very interesting about you is the way that you move. Like, mm. you, like you, you are an amazing communicator, but you are naturally just moving Energetic. your joints. It's like, yeah. and, and, and this is a great thing, because you're, you're – just by living, you're lubricating everything. That's the best I can do because <laughs> walking around lubed up, Gil. I'm walking around lubed up. Right, just, just um, I'm like a living astroglide. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, uh, so, uh, so I, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a cautionary tale, though. Where do you I, think that stiffness comes from? Like when somebody kind of get somebody sits around a little bit and they go to mm. get up and because like sometimes it's not even for that long. You might have only sat down for 15, 20 minutes to well, get back up. And let's talk about we go back to that body work when you body work and you lean on somebody. What if that body work leans on you for 20 minutes? It's too much. It's yeah. too much. Well, what if you put all your body weight on your ass for 20 minutes? It's too much. It's too. It's the same thing. You're you're literally like your ass. Put all your body weight on your ass. Yeah, ass <laughs> that's such a great way to look at it. <laughs> right? you what you doing, putting all your body weight on your ass like that yeah. for so long? <laughs> and your ass is a sponge, right? And you're compressed a sponge, <laughs> and you squeezed all the water out of it, and all that vasculature is getting compressed, right? I like that. I like. That. <laughs> and uh, and so at, when you stand up, it's like. <laughs> You know, your ass is just going like sucking the water back into it from the rest of your body. Your cheeks get smaller. You know, when you stand up, I'm teasing you. <laughs> Can you imagine? You, you go from one cheek to the other, you know, depending upon whether you're lying on your face or your ass. And the che cheek compression is like a pump back and forth. <laughs> if you say that seriously, yeah. shit, yeah. you can fool me. I'm totally serious. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like, it's like I was teasing about my posture in the laboratory, right, when I'm bent over a table for hours at a time. And I joke about the yin yogis, right? They'll hold the posture for five minutes I'm like that's candy as compared to five hours you should try it but it's not good for you the five minutes is amazing for you but the five hours is not good for you mm -hmm. the five hours of sitting right is is like holding a posture for hours and hours uh, I don't, there's nothing that couldn't be good for you for that long mm. right? even standing or walking yeah yeah I mean or sex can you imagine <laughs> A five-hour session? Nope. There'd be nothing left of you. <laughs> need, a, need a break in there somewhere. <laughs> need a break in there somewhere. Just get a little little hydration, et cetera. So, yeah, so there's, um, yeah, so sitting, yeah, is never going to be good for a long period of time. But it's not to say don't sit. We're capacitated to sit. We can do that. It's one of our options. This can't be the only option. You can get tired of standing, too. Mm -hmm. you, know, you spend eight hours on a factory floor, and you're going to be tired, right? So uh, one way or another, you got to do different things. It's not about what the behavior is. It's about that is not the only behavior, yeah. right? Because the things that we repeat, they become grooves and habits and neural ruts. So you have to do something different. You know, if you never move the same way twice, life's going to be good. Mm. Uh, you know, you can just keep – but we – again, we talked about behaviors in our conversation before we got on. And certain, certain neural ruts are, are – 
good for you, <laughs> right? If you want to, you want to, when you're doing powerlifting, you want it to be perfect, right? Yep. <laughs> you you want the the each movement to be in a groove where you're accessing all the strength that you have to accomplish that exchange of force. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you you don't want someone to give you some big wiggly giggly massage right before you do that, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going to put you off your game. So uh, you don't want to tweak an athlete's uh, groove right before their Olympic trials or something like that. They, they, they need time to integrate it and to make that change. Um, you know, hmm. It's time to step up your wardrobe. Now we've partnered with Viore Clothing because their clothes are stuff that you can wear in the gym, but also on the go to a dinner, on a date, pretty much anywhere. This is their Strato Tech Tank and this is their rain shirt jacket. You guys have probably seen me wear these types of combos on this podcast for a long time now. And the stuff is super comfortable. It fits super well. And the winter months are coming. So you need to get yourself some nice long sleeve wear from their website. They also have a lot of other stuff like their Strato Tech tee, their core shorts, which they have a ton of different colors and they're pretty damn amazing. Their Ponto line, their Ponto performance line with their dream knit fabric is super soft like a baby's bottom as weird as that sounds <laughs> um they have a lot of amazing stuff on their website their boulevard shirt jackets aspen shirt jackets their sweaters let me let me show you something real quick this is their echo insulated jacket and it is so warm and since the winter months are coming i'm going to be rocking this so much more guys there's endless stuff for you on their website that just looks so good and performs so well how can they get it you guys can get it over at viori.com slash power project that's v-u-o-r-i dot com slash power project and you guys receive 20 percent automatically when you go to that uh links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes um you you were uh we were we were talking about uh the the viscous of the muscle and the, the, the water and so on mm -hmm. is there any changes uh do you know like with heat or cold like uh what kind of difference does that make um you know sometimes people uh their bodies might be stiffer when it's cold out oh it's mm -hmm. raining you know my ankle always hurts like mm -hmm. What do you think's going on there with stuff like that? Huh. That's something to think about. Well, with the changes in temperature, you're going to have change in the way the blood flows through that given tissue. Yeah. And so if if uh, you know if your blood is withdrawing from a certain area under certain mm. temperature conditions, then um, that might have been just what was necessary to have made it feel good. <laughs> when you take it away, it doesn't feel good anymore. So I would lay most of that at the door of of changes in circulation based on, on temperature. I've seen your um, uh, speech on fuzz, and you were talking about this mm. fuzz, this uh, um, kind of a fascial layer, and you were saying that uh, it will almost melt away <coughs> as you're touching it. Is that from heat from your hand, or is that from That's from an else? illusion is what that's Okay. From. Okay, so what I called fuzz early in my career, because I'm telling you, I didn't have, you know, I just went into the lab and started taking bodies apart. I didn't like, have what's a, this fuzz an here? instruction. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm pulling the tissues apart and I'm seeing cotton candy between them. Well, w what is it? Oh, there he is. That's old. Look at when well, my hair was dark. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that that um, that cotton candy tissue, right? It does appear to melt away when you touch it. But what I'm actually doing is we've been talking about these membranes that are the interface of differential movement earlier mm -hmm. in our conversation. That's the fuzz, right? What we're looking at in the cadaver is that membrane being torn apart. I have pulled it out of position, and the organization of the collagen in that particular type of fashion is chaotic. It's like felt, right? So if you have a – see that felt? Yeah. See that? Yep. It's like felt. Now, if I, if I weren't pushing that away or pulling it apart and laid it back down, it would be a membrane. And if it weren't a cadaver, it would be slippery, uh -huh. right? So what I'm doing actually in, in those images is I'm pulling apart that slippery membrane in a more dry condition and demonstrating the organization of the fibers within it, which because they're chaotic mean that it can go in any direction, right? Now, and if we're alive, then that tissue is jelly and, fl uh, and fluid, gotcha. right? And so when I say melt it, what I'm really, again, I, I was saying that the images in this, picture, in this video are a little confusing because they give you the impression that we're dry, mm. right? And we're not dry. And it gives you the impression maybe that those fibers don't belong there what they do. But here's the thing. Even though the visuals can be a little distracting, we can have aberrant fiber growth in our tissues. Mm -hmm. We can have dehydration in your tissues. Yeah. So the words I'm using are accurate, but if we take it down to a microscopic level, 
right? You're never going to not have that tissue there. You'd be dissected, right? Mm -hmm. So you always are going to have that membrane there. But what's its quality? What's its condition? Is it in that? Is it in that slippery state, or or has it been reduced even five percent? of its slipperiness. If you have a total loss of 5% of slipperiness in a given muscle tissue, it's going to appear stiff relative to something else. We're not talking about going down to beef jerky like I joked earlier. We're just talking about a slight change enough to change the viscosity of that slipperiness in a negative direction, right? So uh, we don't want to make the fuzz go away. Mm. We want to change its texture mm. in the direction of slippery as opposed to the direction of what I would call gummy. Because when it's getting drier or gummier, it's getting to be like glue. What do they make glue out of? You know, boiled horse's hooves, right? Oh, what shit. do you make marshmallows out of? Do you ever take a marshmallow and stretch it like this, right? And you do it and you mm -hmm. do it and eventually you have like this taffy, yeah, right. right? Well, what is a marshmallow? It's connective tissue, actually. It's actually mm. boiled horse's hooves, you know, giving you collagen. It's collagen fibers plus sugar. And that's what you got. And that's pretty much what fascia is. So we're basically marshmallow people. Yeah, we're, we're <laughs> yeah. And so, and it's delicious at the right temperature, <laughs> right? So, because here's the thing too. If you, if you take those tissues and you go from slippery towards gummy, yeah. right? You're moving in that taffy marshmallow direction. If mm -hmm. you go a little further, you're getting into the crispy duck region, right? So you can go from gummy to cr to crystal. We said so. That's basically the the pro pro progression from health to mm. to uh, to problems. Yeah. Right. And if you have crystal and buildup in your tendons and things, they're going to snap, but they're going to taste better, mm. right? Because <laughs> it's the the Maillard effect is a French uh, scientist. The Maillard effect is describing what happens in cooking, like when you caramelize onions or something, right? What are you doing? You're creating a complex chemical interaction between the fats and the sugars, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it starts to become delicious. It, it, becomes, it puts out smells and stuff. A little crispy. Yeah, a little crispy, and it's, and it's delicious. Right, so the same thing. Basically, your tissues can be like slow cooked from chronic inflammation, so that that same kind of Maillard effect is actually happening in your tissues, and that's why I'm joking. But you do taste better. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. I'm not sure which is the joke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you've prob you've seen so many spines, right? And I think a lot of them, yeah. And an interesting thing that I, mm. I see happening in the fitness industry right now is like there's a lot of people that are realizing that we don't have to only, you know, there's a lot of movements like the squat, the deadlift, mm -hmm. uh, all these movements. People are like keep your spine in neutral position, mm. and that's the way that most people train. Mm. But some people are realizing that well, the spine has moves in a lot of ways, and you probably should, like you just mentioned before mm. when you're talking about sitting you don't want to stay in one position all the time. And your oh. spine, you probably don't want it to be in one position all the time too. So what have you noticed from seeing spines, uh, good spines, bad spines? What, what, um, do you, what do you notice? It's an incredibly dynamic structure. And we have sometimes an approach to the body that's mechanistic. And we think, okay, our arm is a hinge, you know, and it goes like this and you just do that. But if you look at an elbow on the inside, it's super complicated and there can be all kinds of fancy movements. I'm trying to get too far away from the mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can do all kinds of fancy things, micro movements in a joint. Now, the spine, similarly, right, has its organization, mm -hmm. and yet uh, it's capable of all kinds of tiny micro movements within it. It's incredibly dynamic, and it's not so much a set of compression members, right, because it's actually kind of floaty, right? We have our guts, right? are under different pressure differentials inside of your body mm -hmm. so that your organs are actually migrating up towards the low pressure zone of your chest. And that gives your body a sense of lightness and lift, right? That we feel weightless in our guts. We don't feel the weight of them. Why? Because they're trying to pop out your mouth. They're, this is a low pressure zone here and they're migrating up and that 
upward migration of your viscera takes pressure actually off of your spine and makes your spine like a, it's like your head is a helium balloon and your spine is a, is a string and your, mm. and your pelvis is, this, is, uh, is like the handlebars on a bike and you've tied the string on the handlebars and you're going along very happily and there's, it's kind of an undulating weightlessness to that string and you can think of your spinal column that way. Now, when you put 400 or 800 pounds <laughs> on top of it, then it does become a set of compression members, and that's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. and that being said, though, um, you can do all kinds of, and should do, all kinds of movement. Even if you're repeating these behaviors that you're describing, where you're like, keep it in this absolutely perfect position, so fine, maybe for that moment you do that, but don't quit there and think that that's how you should live your life, mm -hmm. right? I walked around like I had a pole up my ass as a Tai Chi guy for years, you know, because I thought I'm supposed to breathe from my belly. Perfect posture. Yeah, my belly is breathing and my, my pelvis is slightly tucked because that's how we stand when we're holding the ball, and yeah. now I just walk through life holding the ball, and I look really ridiculous, actually. <laughs> always ready uh, for a punch to the stomach. Always ready for a punch to the stomach. Exactly. <laughs> I live my life like I was ready for a I'm ready to take a two by four to my belly, and, and hey, you I, never know. Well, you never know, and you know something? It didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so, um, so to your point, I just would agree basically, okay. and say you know to 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 explore all the potential movements of your body, even if you are like in an art form of your lifting or something mm -hmm. that asks you to do certain things. So, like, I have friends who are way into into uh, Pilates, right? Now, Pilates, that's hard stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. And those people are like black belts in, 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 their, in their work. Uh, and if they keep doing it that way, is it going to have a hard time having babies because pel the pelvic core is so tight that they can't literally get anything to go through it. So you have to dance. You have to move. You have to do other things, even though you also do that mm -hmm. to restore it. So if, you, if you're in the habit of consistent spinal postures, I'm just going to say, and do something else later. Wiggle around on, a, on the floor. You know, get to wiggling, get to breathing. Breathe and wiggle. And it'll be good for you. Go for a walk and, and allow yourself to undulate while you walk. Allow the driver of the pelvic gate to, to, to send waves through your spine so that it doesn't get stuck in that, in that position. Can uh, tissues in the spine get dehydrated? Some, like, is... Oh, my gosh. They can turn – the whole thing can just turn to a block. Okay. Uh, in my, uh, I did this project. It was a 17-month-long dissection. I called it the Anatomy from A to Z Project. I dissected two bodies for 17 months. I documented it all on camera. Okay. And one of the forms, I went literally bone by bone, muscle by muscle. I documented every muscle in the human body and put it all on camera. I dissected it on camera. I demonstrated the comparison on camera. I did that with every muscle and every bone. Mm -hmm. When I got to the spinal column... Uh, the, the one formed, uh, uh, Z, he had about eight fused vertebrae. It was just a solid block. The, 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 the bony osteophytes formed across the, the cartil cartilage that would normally be this flexible cushion that would allow that dynamic movement in multiple directions, mm -hmm. but uh, not in his case. It was literally just like a solid block, so he would have mm -hmm. walked around a little bit like a, you know, like a two by four, literally, because mm. there was no no movement going through there, and that was a natural formation that was not fused through surgery. Uh, that was just from holding himself in a certain way for a really long time, and we do that. We'll hold ourselves in certain ways forever. You're like, oh, that's Bob. Here he comes. You know, can spot Bob from, <laughs> from forty yards away because Bob moves a certain way, yeah. right? So, and if and if it was moving a different way, you might not recognize Bob, but it might be Bob. Because Bob could move a different way if he chose to, mm -hmm. right? But if you don't choose to after a while, your body will take a clue and it'll solid it all up for you and make you look just like that for forever, <laughs> right? Yeah, you that's think, oh, go ahead. Uh, really cool because um, so real quick backstory, I had lower back pain for damn near two decades. Oh. I didn't move. I was Bob. You know, mm -hmm. I was. You can see me coming a mile away. I've been working on it, doing all kinds of stuff. And then a little bit over a year ago, I started jujitsu, mm. a thing that I thought I'd never be able to do because of my mm. back pain. Mm -hmm. Now I'm being put in these weird positions and I'm rolling on the ground. I'm getting folded up. Mm. And here we are a year later. And I can say that my back pain's pretty much gone. Amazing. So I'm assuming what's going on there is I had some pretty crystallized fuzz going on in my back. But because I actually got some movement in there, it started to like gummy it up and then make it more fluid, right? Uh, gummy is, uh, yeah, you, you're, you went in the right direction. 
uh, and so and and changed it. You, we are so changeable, so malleable, <sighs> and we don't. And and I'm telling you, even even those osteophytes crossing those vertebrae, I was astounded because when I played with that spine with my hands and put pressure in different directions, mm-hmm. I could actually get movement between <sighs> the segments. You're talking about Bob. I'm, I'm talking about the Z. Z. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm talking about Z. Yeah, yeah Z. same thing. Bob okay. Z. Uh, Bob Z. Andrew. Andrew all Z. The same. Yeah, my last name is Zaragoza. Uh, so oh, it's is a that Z. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I was as- astonished to see, like, in other words, a tree can be green or dry, right? Mm. And even your skeleton, skeletosomy is dried, right? But your bones aren't dried, right? So there's there's moisture in your bones. There's flexibility in your living green bones. And in those osteophytes, there was some give. And that surprised the heck out of me. I was like, oh gosh, there's a little give in these. I bet you if you kept putting movement through these tissues, mm-hmm. the body would get the signal to take <clears throat> that away and it would dissolve it. We can dissolve even bone. We do it all the time. We, if you break bones and you and you and they get them lined up again, and some of the sticking out and bubbles and stuff. Well, that stuff can can realign, right? As the forces transmit through those tissues, the osteoclasts will gobble up those extra bits of bone and and make it nice again. Mm. Well, and, and in the same case, you mm. might have had osteophytes going across your vertebrae for mm. all you know, and then <clears throat> those activities put a demand on the body, and it changed. We can change all the way through our whole life. Uh, but mentally, <clears throat> we can be in ruts so deep mm. that our body just follows suit. Yeah, sometimes you get <clears throat> pain as a feedback, and you're like, "I'm not doing that." Yeah, and someone's like, "Come on, man, just try a little bit of it." But mm-hmm. it hurt. But it does hurt. Mm-hmm. So you're like, uh, mm-hmm. or you even try a couple different things, and they they hurt, or the results take a little longer than you wanted, and then you're kind of grumpy, and you're like, "I'm just gonna." <clears throat> Mm. Right. shrivel back up I'm gonna stay right here don't give me any advice yeah or people will get uh, body work and they'll feel amazing mm-hmm. and maybe they'll they'll move with a little swag you know in their pelvis and they'll come home and the family situation will be like we're not ready for that <laughs> you know uh, you'll know, clamp that back down you know or the reaction could be I've been waiting for that for our whole marriage. <laughs> right? It could be that too. It could go either way. You don't know. But again, our very movement patterns and the way we hold our bodies and consequently the patterns of adhesion right, and stiffness that are generated in the body are also at the function of our social relationships. We move differently in different environments. You move differently at the club than you do in the library. And if you don't, you're going to get kicked out of the library, and you're not going to have any fun at the club. You know? <laughs> yeah. So some people, though, will be in a given way of movement, and this is what fits my church, my family, my job, right? And those are, those are my social environment that's actually literally constricting my movement, right? right? And we have to find another path if we want to break out of that. And I'm not saying get a divorce and quit your church and, 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 or whatever or quit your job, although you might, you know, <laughs> uh, but uh, you might just add something like, yeah, and I'm going to go to the roller rink and I'm, I'm going to go do something that's fun. I'm going to go for a walk or jog. You know, I'm going to do something different so that my, my, my movement pattern isn't isn't wholly formed by the social strictures in which I'm moving because we are, you know, and, and we change how we move depending upon where we are, you know, in our communities in our space. Yeah, uh, seems like the body, mind, and spirit almost cuts off a certain area, just like you might cut off a bad relationship. Mm. So I have a, you know, someone says I have a bad knee, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's mm. that knee's bad, and we can't use that mm-hmm. knee the same way we use the other knee. So every time you get up and every time you sit down. We're just not going to use it, so there's less circulation. Do you Abs- think the body Abs- kind of cuts off? Uh, yes. You know, says so like, hey, like we, we don't need to send help there anymore. It's going to calcify and it's going to be fine. It's not that the body cuts it off; the person cuts it mm. off, and the body obeys because they're not. The moving. body is nature, and it, it, it and, and nature will follow our intention. Uh, as as ru- as rulers, captains of this ship, you know, we set the direction and the purpose and the intention. And the body follows it. You want to do something, your body will step up to the plate 99% of the time. Uh, and, and, if, and if you, on the contrary direction, like say I'm not going to do something, your body will step up to the plate and it will mm. reduce itself relative to that intention. Mm. What you got, Andrew? I'm just, I'm blown away. And I love what you're saying there because Encima reminds me of this all the time. 
about like just checking the way I speak and the way I say things. Like, mm. I suck at this. He's like, no, no, you don't suck at it. You're just not there yet or whatever it may be because it's usually about a jujitsu related thing. But what you're explaining, you know, about like, um, again, going back to my back, I used to say like, I'm that person with the back pain, you know, mm -hmm. I, that became my identity Yeah, and my body followed suit. Mm -hmm. But the second I kind of started moving and getting that hydration back, it's like I am a, a different person now. We curse ourselves. We literally curse ourselves with that kind of language. And we don't realize how powerful that is because mm -hmm. the subconscious takes that information in mm -hmm. and organizes you accordingly. I mean, I, I, I was also that person who I was afraid I was going to be in a wheelchair. I, I, I had so many back outages, right, mm -hmm. at, during grad school. And, I, and then I was like, well, I guess if I keep doing exactly what I'm doing, I'm gonna, I could end up in a wheelchair. You know, but instead, I took up a Tai Chi, and, and that expanded my, my movement repertoire far beyond the monk-like movements that I had reduced myself to as a grad student, mm -hmm. reading books for 12 hours a day. I would literally walk from the south side of Chicago to the, to the, to the uh, loop, you know, six miles, reading a philosophy book. I'd get on the bus, the, the Jeffrey Six, and like I'd come, get on, robbed. come on back to, south, to Hyde Park. <laughs> Yeah. Chicago's a little rough. It turns out nobody wants to steal books, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, oh, he's yeah. fucking philosophy. <laughs> like, exactly. I, I was, my behavior led what made me safe. It's a great um, deterrent. <laughs> but the thing was, uh, that, that kind of movement, that kind of limitation of movement, head down, uh -huh. right? Book in front of my face and, and just moving along. I mean, walking was better than sitting, but I would walk around the library like that. Uh, with my hood up, I was literally like a monk. And I took up Tai Chi and I started like, oh, you can actually do this with your arm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can you can go up and you can go down. Yeah. You can go up and down on one leg. This is amazing. And I was having such a great time. But after six or seven years of that, that became the rut. Mm -hmm. I was like, now every day I spend two hours maintaining this particular movement repertoire. And I think I'm going to jump from a bridge if I do it one more time, yeah. you know, because it became it became a rut. I need to expand beyond that. I need to just wiggle in every way that it's possible to wiggle mm -hmm. and see what else I can occupy in this form. You know, what else? Where else can I find differential movement in throughout this form? Because yeah. if I don't, I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> so you know, a fun habit that I found too is like it's something that has happened over the years, but. Kind of like you, whenever I feel something that's kind of odd, right? Mm. Because I move so much, I just have a tendency to like feel that out, feel that mm -hmm. out, feel that mm -hmm. out. I just keep triggering it a little bit until it's like it starts to feel better. You know? <laughs> and it's it, it's one of those things where it's like someone that stays very still, they maintain that form. And over the years, again, they just maintain that. But if you're moving like you and you just keep your body like adventuring and moving through these ranges, you're, you're going to be able to deal with a lot of things better, mm -hmm. you know? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Do you get a chance to see the brain as well? So many brains, oh, and they're man. so pretty. <laughs> mm. I've looked at hundreds of brains. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's quite a world in there. In fact, at the moment, I'm actually in the middle of a tour where I do a two-hour lecture on the brain as part of the uh, part of the thing. And we even do meditations because I like to take people in so that they can have kind of an internal awareness of that space mm. and uh, become present to yourself. So you can actually move your attention around the body, put it anywhere you want, right? Mm -hmm. You can pay attention to your body in, in different ways. If, and to your point earlier, like, can you cut stuff off? Well, yeah, you just stop paying attention to it. You just mm. ignore it, right? Or you can bring your attention to it, and when you do, you bring it life, and you bring it energy, and you kind of put it back into the into the system. But do you have any particular curiosities about the brain that I could <laughs> attend yeah. to? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, what Like, are there things that you can see uh, physically on the brain, much like with the muscle? Like, I wasn't sure what your answers would be today mm. about whether you could see fascia or how well you can detect it and uh -huh. so on. But it seems to be pretty apparent. Oh, yeah. With the brain, is there stuff that you can – I know I know you can't see, like, thoughts and stuff, but could you potentially observe that uh, someone had, like, a potentially larger brain than another person? Or, sure, you can like, see Like, what are some things of, you can see yeah. that uh, might give you clues about how the person lived? Mm. Well, that's interesting. Good brains actually are kind of real soft, right? They're kind of like semi-firm tofu uh, kind of thing. And and they're inside of like a fluid space, mm -hmm. right, with the cerebrospinal fluid. 
And then there's fascia inside your skull that's continuous with all the other fascia in your body. Uh, the dura mater, for instance, is like a tough fabric that lines the skull and surrounds the brain. And forces, right, of our behaviors are going through the whole body, right? So you have torsion in your hip. That torsion is going to convey through the fascia inside your spinal column. It's going to convey into your skull. It's going to change the shape of your brain. So you actually, your, your brains are actually responding in, in, in their shape because they're soft and malleable to the torsions that are going through the fabric of your body that actually changes the position of your skull bones and changes the shape of your skull. Your skull changes shape, your brain changes shape. It's kind of interesting, just that, you know, uh, to realize, oh, I can have scoliosis in my brain, you know, because if I have that torsion in my spine, it's going to be reflected in a bony position and the brain will get a little twist in it. It's kind of interesting. Is like the that. brain ever stiffer or drier? Than, or well, does it not, not the same as muscle? Well, again, when I, if I'm working with the unpreserved tissues, then it's getting softer by the minute. If I'm working with the preserved tissues, then it's a little more firm. In terms of a living person, I can't speak to it. Mm. You know, so I'm 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 having high hopes that all of our brains are nice and juicy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we have seen some people whose thoughts are pretty stiff, and it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Uh, if that if that mm. does convey in there, Can I don't know. Can you see uh, alcohol or? Uh, <laughs> Tobacco, like, and is is that apparent when you're dissecting a body? Yeah, because I remember oh in gosh, uh, yeah. in junior high, the thing mm. was, if you smoke weed, you're gonna get holes in your brain. Is uh. that true? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Andrew. laughs> okay, just making sure. That is true. That is, no, no. What what? When, when yeah, in the seventies, <laughs> it was like Friday night. People would say, "We're gonna go and fry some brain cells." That's what you yeah. say. It turns out that your brain cells regenerate. So even if you try to fry some, they'll still come <laughs> back, and it's hard to get rid of those brain cells. And if you succeed, well, good for you. But um, so you can see a stroke in in the brain, mm -hmm. which will literally make a void. So if the blood circulation fails to a certain part of the brain from like a blockage, right, then that tissue will vanish and you'll have a gap. And so you, I've seen many brains like Swiss cheese that got holes in them, mm. right? But in terms of, say, smoking, I've dissected so many uh, smokers' lungs. And uh, I got to admit, they make you a little sad. Uh, when you look at smokers' lungs, that's just the feeling of it, you know, because you get feelings when you do this, right? Yeah, it's like, not this like, guy sucks. Yeah. It, can, it sucks that he couldn't stop doing it, right, and causing well, a lot of damage. Well, I mean, some for some people, that's their only pleasure. Like, I had an uncle. My uncle, he was a paranoid schizophrenic, and his his one pleasure in life was smoking. I wouldn't take that from him, even if it mm -hmm. kills him. And he managed to live into his 80s because some of those old Headleys were indestructible. Uh, <laughs> But now my dad, he had COPD and died at 75 because he not, didn't live as long as his brother. You know, but he smoked for 50 years. And, and I've, I know what lungs of a person who smoked for 50 years look like. They look like little shriveled black sacks. And they, and they have bubbles in them that can't ever expand or contract because the tissue is dead there. And so you get like hollow parts of the lung. That's emphysema, right? When, when it, you have, uh, that means blown up. So that means that the air has gone in there, but it can't get out, right? Because there's no more elasticity in the tissues that have lost their, their properties, right? Yeah. So, uh, and then they're like, they're like black as charcoal. Uh, a lung that has been infiltrated with carbon, right, is going to change its color. They're normally pink. We all have pink lungs. But if you fill it with carbon, it, you know, so you can, that's super easy to see. And even the lymph nodes of all of us are actually... Uh, are actually black with carbon in our in our chests here because we're breathing s smoke from cars and stuff, mm -hmm. and they're doing the work. They're doing the mm -hmm. job for us and pooling that out. And I always think if we were living around kitchen fires, right, uh, like we used to in a little cabin with a kitchen fire, and it would smoke up the house, mm -hmm. we would have had much. We would have had smoky lungs back then, mm -hmm. you know. But the smokers smokers lungs they get um, they get nodules they get adherent so lungs when they expand they twist on themselves see they have differential movement too each yeah. lobe is like a joint and so there's a spirillic filling of the lung and as it 
twists inside while you breathe, then the lobes slide over each other. It's quite beautiful. There's a light fluid in there. It allows them to be slippery relative to each other. But in that smoker, as long as they stick, and it just fills up like a block. It's like a knuckleball. There's no spin to it anymore. Mm, yeah. So those are a few things that are the downside of smoking, other than the fact that it also kills you. Now, something like alcohol... You drink too much, you can see an alcoholic's pattern very easily in the guts, right? Mm. So if someone's having a liquid diet of, of alcohol, and many people are like that, well, what's going to happen? Your intestines are going to shrink down because they're not doing any work particularly. It's just liquid going through them. It doesn't take any muscle power to get the liquid to go through particularly, mm. right? Just a little bit, not what like takes to get regular food to go through there. So the intestines will change. The liver will change. Because alcohol gets broken down in the liver, mm -hmm. right? So what is one of the byproducts of that breakdown is basically uh, – it's like formaldehyde, you know. Mm -hmm. Basically, as you break down alcohol formaldehyde, what is formaldehyde? It's a preserver, right? So uh, it's also a carcinogen. So you have a carcinogen that, that, that preserves things. They use it to make plywood, right? You put formaldehyde on it to keep the molds and the mildews mm -hmm. out of plywood. So if your liver is producing that through the processing of the alcohol, then those toxic fumes, right, are perfusing through the liver tissue and pickling it while you're alive, right? So it, it, it starts to kill c cells within the liver. And, and when a liver, <laughs> that's wow. the lungs expanding there. It's just um, tripping me out. <laughs> uh, so uh, so when, the, when the liver uh, hardens like that, it gets scar tissue uh, and, and gets hard mm -hmm. and lumpy. And, and you're like, okay, we got a, a liver that's going lumpy and hard. We got skinny intestines, right? And, uh, and you start to see these evidence of like alcohol poisoning, basically. You are asleep for one third of your entire lifespan. You might be doing everything while you're working out, your nutrition, everything during the day to optimize things, but your sleep might not be where it could be. So, that's why we partnered with Eight Sleep Mattresses because the temperature of which you sleep at makes a big difference on your sleep quality. And Eight Sleep has all the metrics to make sure that your HRV, your bed temperature, all these things are moving you in the right direction. Eight Sleep has totally changed the way that we approach and the way we sleep for the past three years now. Andrew, how can they check it out? Yes, that's over at eightsleep.com slash power project. And when you guys go there, you'll automatically save $150 off this amazing technology and the best sleep of your life. Again, eightsleep.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. You know, I don't know if you can tell um, if somebody, well, maybe have some background on some people if they're like an athlete or if they did yoga or whatever. But we've had quite a few people come onto the podcast and talk about breathing. Mm. And a lot of times you can see some people who breathe, it's always shallow breaths, it's perpetually up here. And then some people are able to expand and contract this area, you know, their diaphragm, and it's like they're, they're breathing there. And I wonder if you're able to see how that breathing has a difference on the cadaver, like the, the mm. organs and the, the muscle tone and all of that down there versus somebody who you, doesn't. You can see differences, and it shows up even in the skeleton, right? Okay. So some people have like what we call like a fixed, uh, a fixed inhalation pattern where the ribs kind of are flaring up, mm -hmm. right? And, and they're kind of stuck there, and you'll see that in – like the ribs will change position permanently, wow. right? Or you can have a fixed ex expiration where the where the ribs are pulled in and down. So that's one sort of impression that can be made upon the skeletal form by the breath. Uh, and it's interesting. And then you can look at the diaphragm itself mm -hmm. and see like an atrophied diaphragm of a person that doesn't just, just not, they're not working it out, right? Or yeah. you see a, now in a living person like an opera singer. It's, Rachel's an opera singer, by the way. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it does. It, you have a strong diaphragm of your opera singer. The muscle tissue can actually get thicker, mm -hmm. you know, so you can see that too. So there's, uh, well, with respect to what you're saying, you see some people have shallow breathing, some people maybe you see their belly moves. Um, really, a breath is, is like the, the filling of a balloon. And when you fill a balloon, it fills in every direction, right? Yeah. So you, you can. Good luck trying to blow up a balloon on half of the balloon, right? It doesn't work that way. So an ideal breath would permit the balloon to fill 
and expand in every direction. Yes. Right? So it's got from up to the bottom, it's going to expand like that from out to out, right? The whole thing, everything, everything degrees. upon which, exactly, upon which the breath could make an impression because of the expansion of the lungs is pushing the abdominal organs, which has to be give space for that by the relaxing of the abdominal wall. If people are hold, chronically holding their abdominal wall, right, then it doesn't permit, right, the displacement of the viscera in this way. Yeah. Because you think, oh, I look fat. <laughs> no, tight. you're just breathing. That's breathing, right? Mm -hmm. But so if you are chronically trying to give that washboard abs on the beach, look to your body and wait for that two by four to hit it at the same <laughs> time, then you're literally holding your breath for your whole life. I know I did it myself. I was a breath holder, you know. Mm -hmm. And my Tai Chi teacher had said, and I didn't hear quite what he was meaning by it, right? And we misunderstand things, and then we do it for 10 years, right? So he says, you know, breathe from your belly, right? Yeah. Which could mean relax so that you allow the air to fill you in every direction. I took it to mean don't allow your chest to expand when you breathe. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, God forbid anyone see my chest moving when I breathe. And I held my chest down. And my little belly went back and forth all the time. Yeah, yeah. And basically I held myself in that position for years. Well, I was suffocating. I was terrible for my body, right? When I finally, I finally went to my rolfer and he's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Stop doing that. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. I'm doing something. I'm actually holding myself in a certain way relative to an idea and we all do that but it depends on what your idea is your idea might be i'm a free spirit and then you move very differently than if your idea is i'm a monk you know yeah or i'm a tai chi guy yeah you know we were talking a little bit about digestion in the gym and you were talking about people just allowing uh, kind of natural peristalsis and i found that mm -hmm. to be interesting so mm. you can Elaborate on that a little bit, because we talk a lot about poop on this show. <laughs> well, well, Mark, <laughs> I've thought a lot about poop, and uh, yeah, and basically we we are in in poop trouble. We're in deep shit in this country <laughs> because, because we're we're throne sitters, and uh, we we think that's how you should go to the bathroom. And uh, and we sit up we sit up straight on a toilet and wait for something to happen, and nothing happens, right? And so we push. And because nothing's happening, we got things to do, places to go, things to see. The book is over. The chapter's done. The fact that we have books in our bathroom is because it takes us a long time to shit, yeah. right? Because it's not coming out because of the way that we're sitting on the shitter, right? So if, if we, we have to change those things, right, in order to restore the muscle tone of our colon. And we have massive colon sickness in this country. And I tell you, it goes back to the way we, we, we poop. So... Or you um, need coffee every single morning. Or And coffee. There's all sorts of ways that we can make ourselves poop, given the fact that the positional element is, is off. Mm -hmm. So we might drink coffee, and that caffeine will, will get it going. Or, or we might push. That's extremely common. We do what's called a Valsalva maneuver, right? We, we hold our belly wall, and we push down mm -hmm. and create pressure against uh, our colon that way. And then the body's like... It's just squeezing a tube of toothpaste manually, right? But that's not the design at all. We have a wave, a beautiful wave of muscular contraction that moves naturally through the intestine. We have a little ring at the end. It's called the external anal sphincter. Mm -hmm. So if it's just not an appropriate time to take a dump, we can actually say, sorry, body, no. It's not socially acceptable <laughs> to lay this one out on the kitchen table. <laughs> we have to move to another room, right? So it might just, you're on a bus. There's no potty. you got to wait, right? That's okay. You know, but the thing, or there's a blizzard, and then there's another blizzard blizzard and you're in a little cabin in a little house on the prairie and there's a rope going out to the outhouse and the whole family's going to die if in the <laughs> blizzard so you just hold it for a week and the, and or you're just protestant and that's how it's done <laughs> you know so god bless all the process i got nothing wrong with that no but i'm just saying that in the old days you know that was mm -hmm. the thing we're all the whole family's going to shit on sunday whether you want to or not so uh if if we have these patterns you know how do we overcome those patterns and restore the natural peristalsis, the natural undulating muscular contraction that's native to our colon for health? Because if you're pushing, you're going to get hemorrhoids. If you get hemorrhoids, you're going to be sore. If you're sore, you're going to bleed. You know, and, and, and the toilet paper is going to be like you know, rubbing. Uh, you know, all these things get in the way. 
right? So we want to have pleasure in our body, not pain and soreness and risk of infection, and 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 that can be uh, not good. So, so what you do is <laughs> instead of using the fake tricks like pushing, you just fold, right? Fold what? All the whole planet shits by squatting, right? But we have a chair. So we don't, it's hard to squat on that chair unless you get up on it. Yeah. And you can. You can do that. But then they're going to splash and there's going to be all kinds of – you're going to have to lay paper towels down into take the – Take your pants off all the way. You can take your pants <laughs> off all the way and then it gets splashy. But instead, you can just lean forward. It's the simplest way in the world. It doesn't cost a penny. All you got to do is sit on your shitter and lay your belly onto your thighs. It's easier to do than squatting, right, because mm -hmm. it doesn't involve the ankles, Right where you might have shortness of the of of the tendons there, and you might not be able to squat down. But if you just lean forward uh, on the toilet on on your belly and breathe, right, or drink a glass of water instead of a cup of coffee, and sit on the toilet and lay your body to your thighs, right, and breathe, and wait, and you just and don't force it, don't push it, just wait. For that peristalsis, because this is how your nervous system is built. Your nervous system is built so that when that thigh approximates the belly wall, it's against the colon, mm. right, on either side. And yeah, you're talking yeah, yeah. to your colon. And as you breathe, it changes the internal shapes, not pushing, but breathing, yeah. right? And, and your body you will quick. be like, oh, yeah, and it'll start that wave, and that poop will come out. All right, all right. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Do, does, uh, does your shit come out on the inhale? <laughs> does your shit come out on the inhale? When you breathe in your shit, does, does like does your shit come out on the inhale? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Right? Exactly. Your shit comes out on the inhale. Because when you would take that inhale, you notice like it starts to relax. That's your, right. Your butthole just it that's, goes up. That's, that, that's it. That yeah. wah. That's I like that. Yeah. I want you, you should that play the sound wah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be an additional so this thing. This guy needs to lean forward a lot. <laughs> okay, now look at this picture. See, there's a problem there. He's got his squatty potty, but he's sitting up still. Uh, lean against your thighs, right? Because the squatty potty, if there's no flexibility in the hip or ankle, it's gonna push your back against the seat mm -hmm. and you're just changed the position of the of of the body without changing the relationship of the abdomen to the thighs. You have to change the relationship of the abdomen of the thighs to poop naturally. Mm. And that's what squatting does automatically when you when you squat, it it brings your thighs to your abdomen. You know, and if but if you sit if you it doesn't matter squatty potty or no squatty potty, the goal is to orient the thighs and abdomen into contact. And as you breathe, you bring them into contact. When they're close, you breathe, they'll get closer, mm. right? So it's that, it's that breath. And that's, that's like an, uh, a structural signal to your nervous system that this is the pooping time and it'll, it'll kick in. We had a uh, legendary jumper slash dunker on our show before. A, a dumper? Yeah, a dumper. <laughs> legendary dumper. A legendary dumper. They could just <laughs> lay it down by the pound. <laughs> <laughs> he might be able to. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Could so it. did I hear that wrong, Mark? Or were you du dunker. Dunker. He's, dunk, he's like dunking dunk, basketball. Oh, basketball. Oh, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he talked about eating in a position where um, he would eat with uh, seated on seated on the floor. With his uh, knee kind of pressed against his stomach, so they didn't okay. eat too much. It was like uh, oh. natural, like in his culture, where they would do okay. that. Okay, well. and so it just wouldn't get like uh, you know. In America, we tend to you know eat our food, get pretty full, and then go back for seconds, and then go back for dessert, <laughs> uh -huh. and just continue to eat. But we're in a reg regular seated position. We don't have any pressure built up, mm. and so if you're in that built up pressure uh, position mm. while you're eating, it should prevent you from overeating. That's interesting. Yeah, well, all these things, one to do, but, all mm. these things happen around the planet. Or, you know, you sit around a, a family plate squatting. Right. Um, and it makes it more challenging to breathe and makes it, you know, so that then your, your breathing should be uh -huh. better. The amount of food that you consume mm. should be a little bit better. Everything should be slightly improved by just these small, yeah. they're like weird for us, but these small changes. Mm. Yeah, the eating is an interesting, interesting thing. What's the right amount of food what's your body's signal when do we feel satiated right yeah. and uh we tend to eat fast there's no time to be satiated and you can put a lot of food in in a short amount of time um, no intention yeah no intention when we chew our food 
and the enzymes from our saliva mix with it. Mm -hmm. It digests it in our mouth, and there's like sweetness comes out, different flavors come out that you might taste if you just bolt your food, right? And actually, those flavors give you pleasure. And pleasure actually gives you a satiation trigger. Mm -hmm. So if you skip the pleasure in your food, you will not feel full, and you'll just eat more of it, right? And it's interesting that way. Like my dog does. My dog pretends mm -hmm. that she didn't get fed. Daisy. She mm -hmm. eats it in like one second. Mm -hmm. She's a bolter. Yeah. yeah. Dogs bolt because they're trying not to get killed. In, <laughs> right. Right? So they're like, then they're also fighting with the other dogs, right? In the in nature, right? Yeah. You got a pack of dogs and they're all trying to eat the same carcass and they're going to bolt it down and run away and throw it up and chew it in their own time. Um, mm. We don't have to eat that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We can, yeah. we can slow it down we a little bit. We can slow it down a little Are bit, there yeah. some uh, other diseases that are uh, very visible? Are, are there some things that you've seen that have kind of surprised or shocked you or, where you're like, man, I wasn't didn't know I would be able to see that somebody had diabetes or something like that? Mm. There's so – well, I tell you, cancer can come up in a thousand different ways. That is not one thing for anyone who thinks cancer is one thing. It's a whole lot of different things. But, it look like a lot of different yeah, things to you? it can look like a lot of different things. But uh, so, for instance, the cancer – can look like like blue cheese, you know, where it's kind of gone through the organs and, and there's like patches of different color and it looks like mm. blue cheese. Or it can be a tumor. Uh, it can be a tumor wrapped around something. I've seen tumors crawling up the spinal column, mm. you know, that end up in the brain and go, go all the way right through the whole spinal, like a cancerous wow. spinal column. That was pretty strange. Um, I mean, there's so many... A human, but what, maybe what surprises me more than the weird things I've seen that way is that someone was alive with that, you know, and our incredible resilience as, as the human beings. We're like weirdly fragile and resilient at the same time. I mean, you just, you, you, we could, well, you know, we're not promised a day and, and you can walk in front of a pickle truck and the gig is up right then. And then also... Uh, we can endure these incredible, bizarre states within our bodies uh, for years and years. Um, I mean, I've seen bodies, congenital one lung. That was crazy. Like this lady had never had a lung on the one side. She was just a one lung person. We so, had a woman on the show that had one lung, right? She was like a MMA fighter. Wow. Right? That's um, amazing. Long ass time uh, ago. Um, mm. I think she was friends with uh, Gabrielle Lyon, but... Mm. Yeah, and, and what well, happened was is her one lung sort of took over. The one killer, lung became Kilo Killer Gilbert or something. Her, the one uh, lung became like almost as big as two lungs. Wow. Well, that's and uh, that's uh, that's the adaptation, right? And we're good at it. This other version of it, I saw the person's liver just migrated into where the lung was. So she had a lung on one side and a liver on the other side. Wow. Instead of the liver being down here, the liver was here. It went all the way up. Did the up, body up look a of fairly lungs. normal? She was 90-something years old. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was a trooper. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, folks, we, we can, you know, just because you don't have this lung or that liver, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we can model along on this planet and do just fine. Like with you being someone that actually sees inside the body, mm. are there things that really concern you with obesity that m might not be well known? Well, some of the issues are again going to be impediment of movement. Yes. Now, I had a 400 pound client in my rolfing practice who was danced beautifully. He was a mover. He loved to dance. He rode a Harley. You know, just because you're heavy doesn't mean you can't yeah. move. But a lot of people will tell themselves that because they're heavy, they can't move, yeah. and then they'll stop moving, right? Um, your knees might not be able to accommodate the weight right. that you're carrying, and that can inhibit your movement. And then that becomes a negative feedback loop of, like, weight and lack of movement. But some of the things that surprise me about weight – I've dissected very heavy bodies. Okay. I had one in Bomber who was convinced that I wanted the heaviest body that he could find. And so he scoured Boston for the heaviest cadavers that could be found and gave them all to me. So I dissected mm -hmm. numerous three, 400-pound bodies uh, over the course of several years. And it's interesting, like the, the fat around the kidney grows. Like where mm -hmm. do you put it, right? So there's the surface sleeve of the body <clears throat> where you can store fat. But there's also within the visceral spaces around your organs. So we have these little floating fatty appendages on our colon. And they can be like little flower petals along your colon. And that's typical and expected. 
But if you're 400 pounds, uh, those those little petals are going to turn into like weighty appendages. So they can be like a half a pound a piece, right, all in a chain along the colon. Or you can have incredible thickness in the mesentery or the mesocolon, which are like the linings of the cavity, mm-hmm. can become can become thick with pads of fat or the packing fat around the kidney, which we need. If you don't have fat around your kidney, you're in trouble. You have to have fat around your kidney. Fat is not a bad thing. Our culture makes it seem like a bad thing. Fat is necessary and normal part of our body. Uh, but if you have like a whole lot of fat, <clears throat> right, say around your kidney, and maybe that's where your body has a propensity to accumulate it, mm-hmm. then it's like a it's like an avocado, right? You have like this little pit inside, and that's mm-hmm. the kidney. And you can have a fatty body around your kidney that's as big as a watermelon. I've seen it that way. And when it is like that, then what does it do? Well, it takes up space, right? And so that's going to displace your organs forward, and they kind of fall out of your pelvis. Now, instead of being a source of lightness in your body Mm. in that visceral space that's being pulled up into your rib cage like i talked about now it's become a source of weight and it leans and falls out of your pelvis and now it's dragging you down that's going to inhibit your movement as well right so there's negatively impact the whole structure negative yeah so we're talking about large amounts of weight here that 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 do that. You can have a nice even distribution of a hundred pounds of weight on the sleeve of the surface of your body and look pretty hot and elegant. And that's not a bad way to move through space. So we can we can't really say what's the right amount and the right place uh, from from one body to the next. But for a given individual, we can say, oh, you carry that really beautifully. You carry that well. Mm. Or uh, uh, it looks like you might have more than your frame. Can accommodate, yeah. uh, and and you might be doing yourself injury by carrying that much weight. But What's then again, that? we don't always have a choice. You know, we b- tend to think that weight is all about choice. But there are people with lipedema, which is a connective tissue disorder in the fatty tissues, where the lipids don't stay in the cells and they kind of leak out, and you have free lipids that you can't re-metabolize. Those people could eat a small amount of food, and it's going to all end up below their hips in giant legs like elephantiasis or something mm. like that. And that's that's not something that you can point out and say that's all about you. No, that's a connective tissue disorder. How common is that, though? More common than you think. Okay. Yeah, and it has multiple stages, lipedema. And uh, so folks can be sort of first or second or third or fourth stage lipidemia, end up in a wheelchair, and, and it doesn't, no amount of dieting is going to change that. It's a connective tissue disorder. And it's actually it's more common in women than in men, although men can have lipedema. Um, it's an interesting and troublesome disorder, particularly because we have so much antipathy towards people who carry too much weight in mm-hmm. our culture, and we have fat hatred in these people. they got no choice about this, and yet they're going to be put into the category of an overeater mm-hmm. when they're actually having a connective tissue disorder. Um, what about the actual structure of the body? Like, even in these larger individuals, mm-hmm. I'm guessing, totally guessing since I don't know, but, like, I'd imagine the bones are similar. Like the bone structure of a male and a female are probably similar. I know there could be small differences in like how much they weigh, and I understand there's bone density, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, bones as you are as out, variable as your face, mm. right? So, I mean, between us, we got eyeballs and noses and right. mouths, right? So, you know, there's a basic pattern here, mm-hmm. but we all have very unique visages, right? You can go to any given bone in a body. Your ulna, your ulna, your ulna, your ulna, your ulna, put them all in a row and marvel at how different they are, right? Even though, like, they're still faces, right? Mm-hmm. There's, still, there's still certain bony prominences on each one of those bones that are recognizable, you know, and yet this one is this thick and this one is this thick and this one is twisted a little bit and this one, because it all depends on what that person's been doing, what forces have been placed upon those tissues to generate a certain kind of shape. I do dissection classes for the last 30 years and one of them is a 10-day class where I have the last four days and we skeletonize. So I have the groups, we take off all the tissues of the body except for the ligaments, so it all holds together, right? And we sort of suspend them by the shoulders, and we put four four bodies side by side so that we started from scratch, from the skin, mm-hmm. brought them all the way through, 
get down to the skeleton and we just stand there with our jaws hanging open at the beautiful differences in the skeleton mm -hmm. and the continuity from one to the next one. So we tend to think of the female pelvis, right, as more of a flared thing, right, that's mm -hmm. uh, able to carry a child and maybe the male pelvis is more organized this way. But when you actually look at pelvises, those are tendencies. And you can see little old ladies are 90 years old with a very uh, upright kind of pelvis and not flared and vice versa. And so we put them one in a row and we just compare literally bone by bone. And they're different, everyone from body to body and from side to side, because not even from side to side on your own body mm -hmm. are they the same. Maybe you're a tennis player. Maybe, maybe you did some behavior that changed the bony morphology even because we can't change our bones mm -hmm. what do you uh, notice about like maybe the density because i remember we were talking to the gym like you've seen some people with bones you could literally stick something through so uh, yeah well density. osteoporosis is a serious a serious problem because mm -hmm. you can get super fragile uh in your bones uh we know that's an issue in our culture i have a friend uh uh, Rebecca Rotstein, she's got a business called Buff Bones, where she, her whole thing is all about facilitating, helping people with osteoporosis through functional movement, using their bodies in a way that creates stress through those tissues. But you got to be careful at a certain stage of osteoporosis. You're going to break mm -hmm. if you do certain things, right? You have to you have to be a little careful. But in the lab, it's so easy to see. I mean, you can knock on it with your hands or you can bat on it with a, a scalpel handle. Or in some bodies, I can literally, as you mentioned, I can pass the scalpel in, into the bone. There's no resistance because the outer surface of it, that hard outer core of the bone, has become like a sponge. Wow. Um, and, those, and those bodies break easily. Mm -hmm. you know, even when you're turning them in the lab, they'll break. Mm -hmm. you know? And when you got into that stage, that's a troublesome way to live. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, we can see little fragile people and, and they're really at tremendous risk from a fall or something. You know, yeah. Pelvis shatters mm -hmm. and, and there's no putting that Humpty Dumpty back together mm -hmm. again. Do you yeah. notice the difference in the thickness of like tendons too, of like individuals who resistance train versus maybe people who, I mean, I know you don't always know the history, <laughs> yeah. but like re resistance training is getting more popular amongst older populations because mm -hmm. they're realizing it can improve your bone density. It can improve the resilience of your tissues. It would be so satisfying to have a ton more information yeah. on the bodies that I work with. You know, okay. We have a funny thing about anonymity in our culture of donation. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily to the advantage of our education. I don't think any harm really comes from knowing who the donor is. The project that I just did that I'm touring around the country right now, the donor was a friend. You know, I actually knew this this man. He was my, my, my friend's dad and he had spent, uh, visited our home home many times and this is a friend of the family right uh, and he donated his body for the project and and so we knew a lot about that body mm -hmm. is all i'm saying to your point and and but most of the time i know nothing and i'm just trying to put the pieces together it would be interesting to have more information but even then i'll mm -hmm. tell you there was one program that i used for many years and i would get a sheet of paper with the handwriting of the donor with a page of their medical history that they would write out for us which was Super interesting and often wrong, mm. right? Because, you know, you go to the doctors, they say something, it's fancy words, you don't know what they said, mm -hmm. right? And then you and then you t start to tell a story about what happened to you or what they did in your surgery, and it's not the, it's not actually what happened, you know? And then you write that down for me, and I'm like, you didn't have that taken out, it's right here, you had something Whoa. else done, you know what I'm saying? So they, they mm -hmm. people don't even know what happened to them oftentimes, mm -hmm. so... You know, we're we're not we're not always the own best stewards of information about our body. Mm -hmm. mm. Yo, are those woman sandals? Hold up. These sandals are rooted in millennia of masculinity. Pretty much all the ancient Greek warriors wore them. Also, the ancient Aztec warriors used to wear them in the battle. They're called cactli. The Zulu warriors would march hundreds of miles in them. And so did the Romans. They conquered a bit of land themselves. That's great to know. Is that the new Victoria's Secret drop? Grab your flex sandal now at powerproject.live. What is so amazing about foreskin? Oh my God. <laughs> How many hours does this podcast go for? Hopefully, at least a little bit more. Mine's, <laughs> mine's gone, man. Uh, I'm sorry. Chopped I, away I when I was it. a wee child. Yeah, and that, and that was that was not nice. 
Uh, I'm telling you, the foreskin <laughs> is amazing. And the thing is, if you lead with what's amazing about the foreskin, then you're going to start scratching your head and asking questions like, why did they take it away? So the foreskin, right, is mm-hmm. not an extra, it's not extra skin, right? The, the foreskin is the skin of the shaft of the penis when it's erect, right? So the flaccid penis is a different shape than the erect penis, right? So when the penis becomes erect, it has to still have skin covering it, but it's changed its length, yeah. right? It's changed its girth. And so it still needs to be dressed. It still needs to be covered. So the foreskin is the skin that's there to accommodate the shaft of the penis in an erection. So now if you have an intact penis is what I like to call it, an intact, un, undissected penis, um, then also there'll be play, right, in the skin because you have enough for the erection and then some. So the shaft of the penis is designed to move in and out of itself, right? And the skin, uh, because it's a little loose even in the erect penis, will move back and forth over the glands. And that feels good. <laughs> and that foreskin is, is the most erogenous part of the organ. It's the sexiest, most nerve-filled. <laughs> so fucking bad. <laughs> it's, the, it's the nerve-filled part of the organ. And what it does is it gets a little slippery down there at the end, right? Because you have that viscous substance that comes out of the, comes out of the glands, right? It's, and it's kind of clear and, and slippery. And that's to lubricate the movement of the foreskin over the glands, which makes it feel even better, right? Now, you take that whole unit and you put it in something else, a hole in the wall, a good friend, someone you love, <laughs> right? And and you're... <laughs> oh, fucking going glory all over here. <laughs> he, said, he said we could talk about yeah, stuff. Yeah. That's right? amazing, so the way. Talk a sock puppet, whatever you got. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of crusty now, socks, bro. A hand, oh, a hand with a velvet glove. I don't take care it what, wherever you can. I don't care what you got, right? And then what you're going to do is you're going to facilitate the movement of that skin over the glands and eventually you're going to reach a point where the the electromagnetics of that reaches a point where you ejaculate right so so if you put that in another place right then that place that you put it is protected wow there's no abrasion right you have uh say you're in a vagina for instance right now a vagina has a different design right it has kind of a circumferential erectile tissue that expands like a like a filling donut mm-hmm. right and then that, as that donut fills then that aperture get, gets tighter right and it squeezes on whatever might be inside of it so the vagina pins right it pins the skin the foreskin to the shaft of the penis which is moving in and out of itself yeah right the penis is not supposed to be abrading the vagina Right. Mm-hmm. So if you follow that design, then the vagina is enjoying pressure. Right. The whole vulva enjoys pressure. That's the kind of way those nerves are set up. The pressure of one pubic bone pressing against the clitoris and all that. Right. You have a pressure system that's pleasurable. And then it's not the pleasure doesn't come from rubbing your penis off on a vagina for the vagina partner. Right, that's just abrasion and irritation. Mm-hmm. It's de- it's injuring the delicate epithelial walls of the vagina. That's not the design. The design is that you move in and out of your own skin while your partner enjoys the pressure of that movement exchange. Right, they get off on the pressure. You get off on the friction of yourself to yourself. Right, and then the whole party is is nice. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens if you? There's more, but but wait, folks. There's more, right? So the the because the the glands of the penis is normally covered in that skin. It's protected. It's an aperture. It's an opening in your body, and all the apertures of our body are protected, mm-hmm. right? We got eyelids. We don't, you know, we, we get the sand off. man. You don't cut mm-hmm. the eyelid off, right? It'll dry it out. Yeah. Right. So what happens to the glands when you take away the foreskin? <sighs> dry. It gets dried out. It gets sclerified. If you look at it under a microscope and cross section, have twenty extra layers of of squamous epithelium dried out there. It's a callus. It's like the butt of your hand instead of the inside of your lip, mm-hmm. right? That's the design. It's like the inside of your lip and it's protected and covered, right? And as the skin 
right? Because this is skin that goes two ways, right? You pull it back and you see skin, you pull it forward. So there's an inner layer of skin surrounding the glands. And that skin, like all the skin of our body, sloughs off, right? So how does it slough off? It's like apoptosis, is little enzymes that like explode the cell and it sloughs off. So those enzymes in the normal structure slough off and they have an antibacterial property because if they could kill your cells, they'll kill bacterial cells too. So that's your immune system, right? That foreskin is your immune system for that part of your body. It's a mechanical protection of the opening, right? It's also creating the right moisture environment and it's sloughing off skin that we call it smegma, which is a Greek word for soap, mm. right? And that's not a bad thing. That has an enzymes in it that have antibacterial properties. You don't mm. want it to build up too much, right? Because it can get then it gets sticky and the skin can stick to itself and you get adhesions, right? So you clean yourself, but still it belongs there that stuff. And the, and the 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 vulva also has smegma, and you, you, we can take a bath, right? We can wash our face, we can wash our intimate parts. So we have that foreskin as the immune system of the penis. It's also the er most erogenous aspect of the penis. It's also the protection of the partner in, in terms of the movement and the friction. And it's also stimulating, right? Uh, so this is all good stuff, right? Yeah. This is all good stuff. Now, what happens if we take that away? Okay. So if you take that away... And they take it away in a serious amount. Yeah, they do. Now, they actually protract it, right, in order to get more. Mm -hmm. Like more is better somehow in this case. And it is if you're going to sell it because they do upsell that foreskin. These motherfuckers. Right, because they're going to sell mm -hmm. it into the biologicals companies who are going to – and they're going to – call. you can look it up online. They're going to call it um, uh, neo, uh, neonatal uh, dermal fibroblasts. Which that's, is soup for rich people. That's, I fucking knew it. Some yeah. billionaire out there fucking <laughs> ate my it's, foreskin it's, in his soup. It's worse than that. It's hand cream for, for facials is what it is. And it's not that kind of facial. It's the other kind of facial. So <laughs> Type in facials. Andy. Okay. <laughs> Don't type in facials. So, so what they do is they, they take those cells and they, and they multiply them in, in the laboratory and then they sell them to uh, you know, <clears throat> companies and, and they use them for products. Right, and you pay for it. So you pay for the surgery, mm -hmm. which you've been told is useful or purposeful, and and then and then you pay for the disposal of the tissue, and the disposal of the tissue fee means you're paying them to sell the tissue, <laughs> right? And you signed away for it on that consent form that somebody handed you. It's a whole fucking business. It's this a, is it's fucked. a huge. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the most common way. surgery in America, is harvesting that skin and giving it to somebody else. So, and what is the effect in terms of sex function is to take away pleasure, okay? Because that's the most erogenous part of the organ and you just took it away. And that was why it was done in this country. Mm, it was done in this country as part of the Great Awakening and the Protestant moralizers wandered around this country having tent meetings. You can read about it in uh, Tom Sawyer and the whole town got religion, right? So you, you have those, those tent meetings and they preach circumcision yeah. as a cure for the moral ills of lust and masturbation. Right now, fellas, did you stop masturbating? Once no. no. <laughs> so it didn't work. It was, it was false. But it did change the sex dynamic, okay? So someone like that crazy man Kellogg back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> have you talked about old Mr. Kellogg? Please talk about Mr. Kellogg. Yeah. Well, Mr. Kellogg was, was as much of a nutcase as ever was. And it's not because he was the genius behind cornflakes. It's because <laughs> he was as anti-sex a Victorian as ever was born. Uh, he, he never had sex in his life, except he did get an enema from his male servant on a daily. So I don't know what that was all mm. about. But he, he had adopted children because he, he was so, so anti-sex that he never had sex with his wife. Wow. Uh, but wow. he didn't take it up the ass on a daily. <laughs> <laughs> With yogurt and coffee and anything else he could put up there. Probably gumby and gerbils and God knows what else made it up there. So anyway, he, he, um, so he, he advocated putting like little spiky underwear on small boys and, and cauterizing the clitoris. Right? He, oh, yeah, what? Cauterize the clitoris. Right? This was recommended. All he had to do was just come out. Yeah. It, would have been fine. it would have saved so much trouble, right? right? But he was part of a general movement. The doctors were on board. Everybody was on board with this. So circumcision was introduced in this country for the specific purpose of reducing sexual pleasure. Right? 
to change the dynamics of sex take that away from us, right? And then what years go by, and maybe they change their ideas about that a little bit, but once it becomes part of the culture and it's part of the money system and stuff like that, and then you realize you can use the stuff in the biologicals market, mm. then they'll, they'll create every conceivable rationalization. Oh, it cures AIDS. It does all kinds of things. It's ridiculous. Every year there'll be one or two articles come out in the New York Times telling you how glorious and wonderful is circumcision. I read an article from the CBS News that was online on their website. This was some years ago and it was basically being this it was being sad about how people don't do circumcision anymore it's as if they don't like vaccination or something oh my you know God. they literally tried to tie circumcision mm. to vaccination because this mm. is clearly a pro powerful prophylactic for health for boys it's not that's garbage it's a, to think about it this way you take away the skin now it's tight right? You get an erection, you don't have enough skin to accommodate the rectal tissue. You end up with a bent stiffy, right? It doesn't look quite mm. the same anymore because it doesn't. And where does it get the skin from to cover itself? It's got to recruit it from the pubic area. So now you got hair halfway up the shaft of your penis. And now you're putting that in your partner. That's not hygienic to be filling your partner with your hair. It wasn't designed that way. Mm. The penis shaft is not a hairy thing. The, 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 the pubis area is hairy. But if, if the skin uh, that you're putting, that, that's not hygienic, number one. It's also not hygienic to dry out the glands. Nope. They get cracked and sore, and you can have uh, bacteria get into it because it's no longer protected by the substance your body produces that's an antibacterial to protect mm. that opening and you're abrading your partner and putting that partner at risk right because of micro abrasions inside of their body of mm. other inf infections so all of these are not in service of of health uh, at all and the fuck thing is like some parents maybe think that they're doing it out of love for their child because it's in the bible right like uh, like so a lot of like i'm christian I was circumcised, and it's in the Bible. Okay, let's so talk like, about that Bible bit. Let's here, go. Okay, go. so it's in the Bible, but what part of the Bible? It's in Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It was the covenant between uh, Abraham and and uh, Abraham's God, right? So that all seems fine. They made an agreement, and this is what it looks like, and you're going to be my people, and this is how we're going to know you're my people. He had just about to execute Isaac, his son, but the angel of the Lord <laughs> stayed his hand, and a goat showed up, and he sacrificed that instead, and let's call circumcision at that point in history an improvement on child sacrifice. How about that? How about they came into the land of Cana and they saw them doing child sacrifice and uh, from an anthropological perspective, well, let's not kill the boys. Let's just take a little bit of their skin, right? That'll be better, right? So, so then you do that. But how much skin did they take? Just, just a little bit. They didn't. They, the process that you endured as an American in this country is very different than what the Abrahamic tradition did at that time mm, yeah. and place, right? Yeah. They, they, they made the mark of circumcision. So there was the exposure of the tip of the glands. They didn't protract the skin forward and cut off half the skin of the shaft of the penis. Right? No, they just took off the end of it, and this little bit of exposure became the sign that you were part of the covenant. Mm -hmm. Well, all well and good. We can do whatever we want. It's a free will universe, right? Now, what they're doing to us in America today is the stripping of the glands. It's a different process where you protract the skin forward of that infant, you clamp it, you put a cigar snipper on it, and you cut that skin off in the majority. You take that and sell it upline, and you tell everybody you did a favor to that person. You didn't do a favor to that person. You just robbed them of the sex mechanics for the rest of their life. Now, as surely as they invented circumcision, they also invented restoration. Uh, how long is the restoration? Like, <laughs> is there too late to get restoration? It's never too late. Whoa. It's never too late. Okay. This I've is... been working on restoring my foreskin. I don't, I'm not urgent about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm running around all the time. It, it, so when you, it depends on the level of cut, what it takes to restore your foreskin, right? Because not everybody's been cut the same way. So you can look at someone at a gym and you're like, oh, is he circumcised? Or not? <laughs> I'm really not so sure, you know? So I, I, I never, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was, I was at the, at the tur Turkish baths in New York City at a, at a stag party, right? And we're all sitting around uh, having a steam room and the guys on the other side, side where these orthodox men yeah. and they're sitting there yeah. and I'm looking across through the steamy haze staring at their junk and I'm saying <laughs> like they, what do they got over there because they got more foreskin than any of us 
right? And they had been circumcised by a moil in the pattern of their tradition, and uh -huh. and the the foreskin. Did you get was... in conversation with these guys? No, no, no. I just <laughs> stared rudely. Hey, uh, I it's like, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but you can trust me. I cut bodies open for a living. Yeah. I mean, uh... <laughs> Everything's cool, and I am staring at your dick. <laughs> you just have amazing foreskin. Yeah, I were, couldn't help it. It's like you're like having a chat over there. Like is he staring at my dick? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am <laughs> not shy here. So uh, what I noticed was that the skin was over the corona of the glands, mm -hmm. right? And just the tip of the glands was exposed. And I look at us, and we got the whole corona. So where? what are the stages that could be done? So that would be one, say, let's call that stage one cut, mm -hmm. right? Where just the tip of the glands is exposed, but the skin gathers up over the corona of the glands and covers most of it. Stage one cut. Stage, stage two would be where the skin bunches up to the glands, but doesn't quite get over the corona, doesn't quite cover any of the glands. That would be stage two. Let's say stage three is where you have some wrinkling, right, in, in the skin of the shaft of the penis when it's flaccid, but it doesn't actually bunch up to the corona at all. And then say stage four cut would be where in flaccid normal temperature hang length, you're, there's no bunching at all. It's it's it. There's no um, there's no wrinkling of the skin at all, mm -hmm. right? And then say stage five is when you've actually had other parts of your penis injured through the procedure. Yeah. So where that scar slipper snipper bah. slipped and cut off half of the glands, bah. and that happens every day in America, folks. This is not this is not impossible, right? This it is must part, cause some sort of trauma. It can cause death. Oh. Yeah, Fuck. people can die. They, they, you, they'll do sex changes based on the accidents that happen in circumcision or culture. I'm not saying it, it's happening, you know, 100,000 times a day. Yeah. I'm saying this is part of the mm -hmm. risk. Circumcision is not without risk. Mm -hmm. And people are rudely surprised when it goes wrong, right? And you deglove the penis. That can kill you, right? Where like, oops, we took it all, Fine. right? So that can, uh, degloving injuries can, you die from that. You get sepsis and you die. Right, so uh, so you can think about what I just said in terms of the scale and say, well, how much was took from me, right? What, what have I got left? And then where can I start? But if, so if you have skin already over the, over the corona of the glands, then there are devices, stretching devices. Even if you have it wrinkled up to the glands, you can pull the skin over that stretching device and wear that device and it'll hands-free stretch you while you go about your business. Right now, hmm. if you have a stage four cut, which is what I started with, where I there's no wrinkling, no four, nothing. If you have an erection that's tight and you kind of like, mm, <laughs> kinda bend this way, right? it's like strained, right? And what is that? That's an abrasion stick you got there, right? And and you should take responsibility for it before Sorry, you Sam. Ru before you rub up, rub some friend down to 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 give them a rug burn inside their body, right? <laughs> so you, you, what you can do it, when you you can't use any device, there's no extra skin to put on the device, mm. right? That you could put, and, and again, I'm saying this is not extra skin. This is your skin, right? So you, you take a circumferential hold, circumferential hold around a shaft of the penis. You pull in opposite directions gently. The idea is not pain, right? You just create tension because skin grows under tension. That's one of the miracles of the human body. You put skin under tension and it grows. That's how you, your body got bigger. Your skin grew with it. How do you do it? You put it under tension. So the tensions that run through the forces of your fascia are going to impact your skin, stretch it, and you're going to end up with more skin. You can do that to your, to the shaft, to your penis, right? So you, you, you stretch in opposite direction and change the hole. 20 seconds, change the hole. Change 20 seconds, change the hole. Change the hole. Change the hold depending upon how, how big you are change the hold, <laughs> change the hold right? and, then, huh, and then within months it'll feel different hmm. sex will feel different you'll feel different and you can feel some pride in that you're restoring your birthright because yeah. that's your birthright and you're protecting other people when you do that I've, so yeah i've never been happier to be to have what i call an uncut gem Good and yeah. and when my son was born, we got a lot of pushback. Like, oh, oh you're not gonna like what do you what do you mean? And then even like um, people like uh, in the family and friends of the family, like, oh, but it's gonna look weird. Oh my god! And I'm like, 
Well, yeah, they look like a dick. He's, 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 oh, yeah, he's not going to marry you. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it smells. They'll say. Yeah, or it yeah, gets well, dirty. Yeah, well, so does your <laughs> asshole if you, don't, if you don't wipe it, right? So you have to. And then the infection and this and that, and I'm like, look, yeah, I, no, figured it, I figured it out. Yeah. You know, yeah, and so that's we're right. Good. No, yeah. my sons are intact, and they're grateful because and and people are like, oh, well, he should look like his father. You know, so his, father, his father is ugly. You know, you gotta, you know, punch that baby in the face until it looks like pop. You know, you shouldn't do that. Or, or the, yeah, and they'll say it's hygienic. And I'm like, it's not yeah. hygienic. It's the opposite of hygienic. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, it doesn't pull back. He has phimosis. Well, that's a confusion on the part even of pediatricians in this country. They see an infant and the, and the skin doesn't pull back. And it's adherent. It's not supposed to pull back. The organ is immature, right? So the foreskin is actually adherent to the glands in the infant. And when you're born, your liver's not the same as it ought to be, your brain's not the same as it's going to be, and your penis isn't the same as it's going to be. So it's normal and appropriate for the skin to be adherent because the urine flushes out mm -hmm. uh, the area underneath there. Oh. The urine, urine is the number one humectant on the planet. It's the best moisturizer you could possibly have. Right? Pause, wait. Yeah, that shit's getting is, very is, popular. Is, yeah, so Your, people, Urine therapy? Well, this is a little little different. Okay, urine is the most commonly used medical substance in the United States today. And you don't even know it because yeah. they fraction it and they say uh, creatine and urea, you know, in your hand cream. It's, these are fractions of urine. Mm. We are using urine in our culture mm. all the time. It's a common medical substance. It's the most common medical substance on the planet, including in the United States. But they just call it different things, so you don't got to think about it. And the reason why they put that in hand cream is because those uric acid crystals oh, – wow absorb water right they're 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 moisturizers right so the best moisturizer you can have is the urine going over that glands to keep it moist it's supposed mm. to be moist not dried out right so you don't want to take that away and you don't want to prematurely retract the foreskin of an infant because a you'll tear it and it hurts and that's the first thing they do in a circumcision is they take a probe and they scrape they scrape the foreskin off of the glands that's the yeah, first no, injury man. right so if you just leave it alone Right, the penis will grow, and the and the child will have erections all night long. You have an erection, 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 right? And that's going to break down those adhesions. And by the time you're 12 or so, you know your your foreskin will fully retract. Uh, and if it doesn't, you still you don't force it, right? Mm -hmm. So this and and people will say, oh well, I had real phimosis and my penis was being strangulated. Well, there's more than one ways to skin a cat, <laughs> right? So you can actually stretch that skin. Right? You can use light therapy, you can stretch it, you can do all kinds of things. And there are real and occasional rare medical circumstances where circumcision would be appropriate. But to what degree, even mm. in that instance, you can do a minimalist job. You can just cut that band. You don't have to do a full uh, stripping of the glands. Um, right? Andrew, let's get this man a penis pump. Yeah. But, uh, can you pull uh, up the video? A, that a going I've away you? present? Yes. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. A video yeah, pull up that. I sent you a video. Uh, it's just bits from uh, oh, a penis like, pump video. It's, <laughs> are we gonna get to it's, watch? A it's a pump? how to. Yeah, a how to. I want to see a this. Quick aside. We're gonna get to this <laughs> video <laughs> before you play it. Yeah, yeah. When you were talking about stretching, uh, uh -huh. the foreskin, it reminded me of college soccer. We had a guy. <laughs> I don't know if I told you. We had a guy in the locker room. I'm not gonna name his name. JB, you know who you are. <laughs> he would be just chilling at his locker, and he'd have a stack of pennies. And one day, you know, this is my freshman year, uh -huh. and I was like. Like, guys, what is what's is he doing in the corner? He's over here sticking pennies and seeing how many pennies he can stick in his foreskin. Uh -huh. I think he got to like nine pennies. He was okay. able to stick in there. And he was, yeah. I was like, dog, what the Swing fuck? Around. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's, that's not, not that sanitary. different. That's not that different from the techniques you might use, like a weighted, a weighted bell to stretch the foreskin back to right, restore Maybe JB was onto something. I think JB yeah, is onto something. something. <laughs> yeah, I want to know where it is now. Is it like throw it over your shoulder, <laughs> tie it in a knot? I mean, because you yeah, can keep on going. Now? Is that... Is, 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 <laughs> Is that a scarf, JB? <laughs> it's so warm. I didn't use your real name, bro, so no one it's, knows who you are. It's so Don't worry. Soft. It's, it's <laughs> the softest scarf. It's like alpaca. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, let's see. What do we got here, Mark? Yeah, get some volume on idea. there. I feel so that. Tell me that doesn't feel like a cock. <laughs> <laughs> What is it? Does it? It feels like you like. The other day I pleasured myself to the image of Mrs. Buttersworth. <laughs> she got me there like I was on the express A train. Bing, bang, boom. Talk about a 
River of Ejaculate. <laughs> a volume I had never seen in my life. Now I know what the villagers of Pompeii felt like. So this was going through my head as you were saying certain things. <laughs> well... Uh, now I know what those sad villagers of Pompeii felt like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Oh, so there's uh, well, you pushed you pushed you pushed one of my buttons there. <laughs> uh, so, uh, hey, back to the penis pump. Ba- the yeah. penis pump will promote mm. blood flow to the area. So the whole time we've been talking about, uh, you know, getting blood flow to certain muscles mm. and stuff. As you already know, since you've been dissecting bodies for so long. Um, the penis works very similar, so the mm. penis pump can help kind of restore mm. um, getting blood flow to the area. So, mm. How is the penis pump different than my hand? Oh, well, the penis pump, it has like a vacuum, a vacuum seal. And vacuum it like, seal. Mm. It, uh, <laughs> it like sucks your penis like this way, like if this is the cylinder, and it like pulls it. I'm all for any form yeah. of penis sucking. Yeah, it, and it gets more blood flow to the area. The thing is, people, uh-huh. you know, people always are uh, thinking about like, oh, it's going to like increase the size or mm. increase the length, and it can because it can promote promote more blood flow to the area. But mm. it's not like you're going to be two inches bigger than what you had previously. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, yeah, but you're you'll be circulating well, and mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be functioning better, mm. which is the key. Penises are super interesting to dissect as well. Oh, okay. Right, because of that blood flow is very interesting. Penises are like, uh, well, it's erectile tissue, which basically means spongy fascia, right? So it's spongy fascia that fills with blood. And uh, I've seen fibrous penises. Mm. I've also dissected out um, length helpers and erection helpers, mm. right? Ooh. So people who get things installed yeah. right, to improve a situation. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like expensive ones and cheap ones, right? So you have penis pumps and different yeah, things. Yeah, I interviewed a doctor recently, mm-hmm. and he said that he's doing these surgeries all the time. Yeah. Penis implants. I yeah, was like, oh my God. penis implants, yeah. So yeah, I had one dude who had a, uh, it was, he had, he had the, the, the cheap version, oh. which was just two eight-inch <laughs> nylon uh, stiffies that were installed in the dorsum of his penis. And so he kind of had a permanent eight-inch long (laughs) hard-on, which, of course, now, you know, nylon, you have nylon things is flexible a little bit, right? So so he had to tuck that thing, obviously. Where are you going to put it? And then it kind of froze in the tuck position. So he had an eight-inch curved penis. And when we just laid those... Sounds painful. Yeah, and we laid those two eight-inch devices out on the table there and we all stood around it and kind of stared at him sort of took it in at an emotional level (laughs) and then one woman at the table looked at it and said that's my husband (laughs) and we all looked at her and we looked at it and we she's like and it's fine (laughs) we're like awesome Awesome. i was intimidated (laughs) oh my god Uh, (laughs) Um, oh go ahead I was curious. Um, did did you did you want to stay on the dick though? Like, I don't want to move away from the subject. There's something I always, else. No, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I was curious about the the feet because feet. like mm-hmm. we we've, we've talked about that along the podcast, and you know you can literally see how the you know the footwear someone's been wearing for their life. You can see their feet literally crush in. Like, oh yeah. My grandma lived to a hundred, mm. and one of the things I noticed because she kept active, but there was a point where she had to really slow down, but her feet like, uh, you know, they, it's like they calcified a little bit mm. and they, they, they didn't move didn't as well. Lost the differential movement in the feet. Right. That's a huge problem. So yeah. What do you notice? Uh, what do you notice with feet? And I guess, you know, we do a lot of stuff with bare feet, barefoot shoes mm, and stuff. So nice. how do you see this affecting people? Yeah. Uh, we, we could go off of on shoes the way we went off on toilets. Okay. Right? Because uh, our shoes are not doing our feet any huge favors. Mm-hmm. Uh, my grandma, <laughs> we talk about grandmas, she had feet like pointy triangles, right? Mm-hmm. And so she had bunions on both of her feet. Ooh. That was ultimately her end, right? She got operated on her bunions and 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 uh, and that was the end. But she was 90. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's, fr- that's a shoe thing. Yeah. Right? And that is not healthy. And when your feet are, are forced into an arch... That that doesn't belong to them, right? Mm-hmm. And and then and you're not having differential movement. You need to, the foot is like a diaphragm that's pumping your lymphatics. It's pumping your blood. Uh, it's it's a it's a pump, pump uh, helping to improve your circulation, right? Yeah. 
Now, this is why walking is so important because you get that that pump in the lowest diaphragm of your body to help facilitate the blood flow and the lymphatic flow back. Mm -hmm. So you need to have that differential movement. And we lose it because we put our shoes into boxes. I mean, sorry, we put our feet into boxes called shoes. Mm -hmm. And then we don't, we, we reduce the, the, the movement potential, the dynamic movement potential. Now, all three of us, no, all two of us, are standing on these crazy yeah. mats that you offer me, yeah. and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Like I just love it. Like I'm, I'm just giving myself a foot massage through this whole conversation, and that's changing the position of my bones relative to each other. But in the lab, I absolutely see the f frozen form of the foot, mm. right, and the way the bones have conformed to that person's favorite shoe, and and the way that the bones have moved out of position in order to accommodate those shoe, and then you lose that diaphragmic function of the foot and your whole health deteriorates from it. So, I mean, that's the foundation of the tower. And you need to have it be a dynamic foundation because gravity's going through this body and it's never still. You know, you can't hold still. You put a, you can hang a pendulum off your dick and go <laughs> put it down to the ground, right? And, and, and then you just stand over a piece of paper and put a little piece of graphite on the end of that pendulum. And it's going to just be tracing a little <laughs> scribble on the ground all the time, no matter how still you try and be. You could do it on your tailbone, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's the thing. We need to have that dynamism. But I, I think, you know, as much as we use shoes, you get out of them, too. You know, yeah. I'm not saying don't ever wear a shoe. And there are people who get fanatical. I had a barefoot marathoner take my class, and his feet was like Sasquatch. I mean, he had the most amazing uh, <clears throat> feet. They were thick, muscular feet. Barefoot marathoner? Uh, barefoot marathoner, yeah. He was a barefoot marathoner. Wow. And he had some crazy-ass-looking feet. His body had adapted to that behavior, right? It took practice to get up to that, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, what he evolved in his feet were these thick, muscular, widely spread feet. Yeah. And they were really cool looking. I, I wouldn't want them. <laughs> <laughs> he can't even put a shoe on, probably. He probably couldn't put a shoe on, yeah, at that point. Mm, uh, but, amazing. you know, you grow massive calluses. You grow moccasins on your feet if you're barefoot, you mm. know, basically. You're going to grow massive calluses that are going to protect to protect you. Who um, are the types of people that show up to your seminars? I heard the one here was very successful, was sold out. Oh, for the talk, yeah. I, yeah, we packed out the Railroad Museum's Theater. What a beautiful museum that is. We had oh, yeah. a good time visiting it, Rachel and I. And then we filled the theater. Yeah, and folks come, uh, massage therapists. Uh, we had biodynamic craniosacral osteopath types coming. We had yoga folks, Pilates folks, uh, structural integrators. Uh, we had the Ten Segrity you from uh, from Nevada City, the whole, 20 of them came down and came to the talk. So those mm. are the kind of folks who filled the talk, yeah. PTs, probably a couple OTs, wow. those kind of folks. All I, just from following your interests, following what you love, following. Yeah, it's your, all word of mouth. I haven't really yeah. advertised. I mean, I got a mailing list and a Facebook page, but I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I haven't spent a dime on advertising. We just don't have that dime. And so we, <clears throat> we just, um, if people talk about it and they're excited. And I do have... After 30 years, folks kind of know I'm out there, and mm -hmm. if I say I'm going to come visit, they get they get into it. So at the moment, we are traveling a country. My partner, all things Rachel and I, we're going to 111 cities over the course of 15 months mm -hmm. to deliver a five-hour presentation on the nervous system. Uh, I had the opportunity to dissect a beautiful donor form. I spent five months in a lab dissecting this one form, and that's became the basis for the conversation that I can bring about the nervous system, trying to help people connect to it. If you see it, you can connect to it. If you connect to it, you can change it. You can live in it differently. Mm. You can embody it. So that's kind of what I'm doing on the road right now. Do you have a link? Oh, a link. Or the link will oh, be yeah, in, yeah, gilhadley.com. If you go to gilhadley.com, the nerve tour, that would be the link. There we go. Uh, Outstanding. Thank you so much yeah. for your time today. I appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure, Mark. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. We did it. This was an amazing episode with Gil Headley. So check out this episode with sexpert Susan Bratton, where she helped us make our dicks healthier and vastly improve our sex lives as she'll help you improve yours. Click here. It's a good one.